morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the session. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just a sound check to, uh, for everybody joining. Uh, good to seeing all the people coming into the session this morning. We just giving all the people opportunity to be admitted. It usually takes a, a few minutes after the starting time so we just can get everybody into the session before we start. So we will be with you in a few seconds. Sound check again. Morning, everybody who's joining. You're welcome to um, greet each other in the chat room. You're welcome to you know share content details and so on. Um, and it's great seeing everybody. We're just admitting more people to the event, and we will be with you in a few seconds. Morning, Knowledge. I'm here attending. Thank you. Morning, Knowledge. Welcome to the event. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, morning, Zama. We are on mute. Good morning, good morning. Morning, Zama. Good morning, Lepono. <laughs> oh, Mr. Mr. Hello, sir.
Well, good morning to all the colleagues. Um, welcome to the transfer forum this morning. It's so great seeing all the people again. Um, and uh, we've been looking forward to this event for quite some time. And uh, obviously, there's still a lot of people will join in uh, to the session. So we'll just admit them as we go along. And while we're doing that, let's just do a, a little bit of housekeeping um, to make sure that we're all comfortable in, in the session. Um, we're doing this in a, a meeting scenario. In other words, we have to ask you to kindly unmute or keep yourself on mute. And when you've been recognized, then you can unmute yourself uh, to say what you have to say. Otherwise, we have too much uh, background noises and so on. I think we all understand the uh, virtual meetings nowadays. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and then the the bottom of your screen, you should see this uh, uh, participants box. So you're welcome to click on the participants box. And we'll see who else is on the, on the meeting. And you can mouse over your own name. And you'll see we're able to change your name should you want to. You know, sometimes the device name is displaying and not your name. So you can rename, rename yourself so you can see who's on the call. Uh, that will be great. Um, further, um, is it making more people? Yeah, further, let me put up our program for today. I can just get the program going here. So there we are, we, we're talking today, transit port terminals, uh, reinvigorating for competitors and future growth. And it's the 22nd of February, 2022. Um, and we're proudly being hosted by transit port terminals. Um, we're very proud of being associated with transit port terminals. They're always in support of the transit forum. We really appreciate that and the, the great communication uh, uh, the transport uh, forum uh, received from transit port terminals and transit as a whole. All right, so um, just a quick uh, review of the program today. I'm not going to spend too much time. Obviously, you guys can read the program and um, we can see that that um, uh, we, we were supposed to have Mr. Jabal and Daki in terms of the transit port terminals, then you're welcome. Unfortunately, we've been informed this morning he's been called into another very urgent meeting. Uh, but uh, we will know um, a lot of other part that will do the welcome for us, as, as if I've got it correctly. And we will work through the program as we go along. So what we're planning this morning is we're looking uh, the first half of the event today. We will look at very much strategic things. Uh, and then the second half. Being that portion, we will look at the more operational planning uh, that uh, Transnet is doing. So, very exciting event, and uh, we will talk us into this program a little bit more again as we go along. I just want to put your attention to the nine o'clock housekeeping and prize winning. <laughs> so, there's two prizes. There are two prizes you can win this morning by answering questions. Um, so just now I will give you opportunity to answer questions and then you will have the opportunity to win prizes. So that's also exciting things we're going to do. Right, so ladies and gents, we understand that, um, uh, maybe I can just mention that, that uh, we haven't indicated on a program, but we will allow uh, opportunity for questions and answers just before the breaks, before the break in the morning, before lunch break. And at the end of the event, we will allow uh, a brief time for questions and answers. We will not allow questions during the presentation, so we will not interrupt the presenters. But, you know, we will do sort of like panel discussions after a few presenters have presented. So we will take care of that. And uh, thank you again for spending time with us today. All right. So the Transfer Forum is a platform that's complementary to the public. And um, obviously, we have to have people that's making that possible for us. And we've got valued sponsors and associates. I quickly want to give recognition to these associates and, and sponsors of ours. Uh, so our formal associates to the Transport Forum are organizations such as the African Association of Freight Porters, of African Space Parcel Association, South African Bus Operators Association, African Rail Industry Association, and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Uh, what we usually do is we display the associates and the sponsors slide. Uh, should there be somebody from this association or sponsoring company who want to say a few words, 
you're welcome to jump in and say a few words. Otherwise, I just the slide, side slide, say a few words in appreciation and we continue. So South African Association of Freight Forwarders established in 1921. It's a national association of members throughout the province of South Africa. Uh, they, uh, the members make a major contribution to facilitate trade within South Africa. Our uh, member companies manage over 80% of South Africa's international trade. So definitely worth your while to engage with this organization due to be a freight forwarder. So African Express Parcel Association is a representative body and voice of the express delivery industry in South Africa. I'm very uh, appreciative of Gary Marshall and his team for supporting the Transport Forum, express, uh, express logistics industry. We've got South African Bus Operators Association representing the, the bus and coach industry. Uh, we've got the, the chief executive is Basil Governor and they also a team support and also host uh, a lot of our events during the, the, during the year, all these associations. So great working with them. We've got African Rail Industry Association. So uh, the African Rail Industry Association is the preeminent body in South Africa representing players in the railway industry. And they're doing a lot of work also for third party access into, you know, getting our rail infrastructure and rail operations in the country up to standard again. And we're very pleased with what they work they're doing. Then the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport is a leading international professional body for everyone who knows what, uh, who works within the supply chain, logistics and transport. Um, it has a while to be uh, a member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Right, let's, let's uh, look at our former media partners. And um, obviously there are many media companies and, and journalists joining the Transport Forum on uh, quite a, you know, a regular basis, but these have formal agreements with the Transport Forum. So we've got Freight News, Railways Africa, and uh, Criminal Media's Engineering News. Um, so let's have a look, Freight News. Is there somebody from Freight News who wanna say a word, few words perhaps? Previously known as Freight and Trading Weekly as well, established, innovative, and effective, ladies and gents, all about logistics uh, news. And obviously, the links to all these organizations you can get from, from the Transfer Forum website. You need to subscribe to these uh, papers to be kept up to date what's happening in the industry. We've got Railways Africa magazine, published weekly online. African continent specialist trade technical business to business online publication covering all aspects of the rail sector, rail infrastructure, very important to be kept up to date. And engineering news, uh, Premier Media's engineering news, uh, premier source of real econ economy news, daily coverage of other transport and important other sectors, accurate and timely news reportage. Uh, we also appreciate their journalists like uh, Irma that's always supporting the transport forum. I would, I would like to, to show you a video that they shared last week's uh, news wrap. Let's quickly have a look at that. So I can just get this clean sorted. I'll be working in a second. He's giving a bit of a hard time. There we go. Hello and welcome to the roundup of this week's edition of the Engineering News and Mining Weekly magazine, published on Friday, 18 February 2022. In this week's cover article, Engineering News and Mining Weekly Senior Deputy Editor Skulk Berger discovers how miners are looking to blend long-term value creation with a zero-carbon future. The mining industry is in an exceptional position to make a bold pivot to a sustainable future, and environmental, social and governance goals represent the most significant opportunity for the mining industry to create long-term value, trust and sustainable growth. 
The engineering news features focus on civil engineering and construction, where industry body consulting engineers South Africa improves on five key focus areas. Industrial and commercial lighting, where a manufacturer provides tailored lighting solutions. And instrumentation and control, where non-contact temperature measurement is vital for the cement industry. The Mining Weekly features focus on energy solutions for mining, where there's no one-size-fits-all for mine decarbonization. And Mining in North America, where a company's software can support the exploration boom. This week's business leader is Malusi Mtuli, President of the South African Institute of Valuers and Provincial Head of F&B Commercial Property Finance in KwaZulu-Natal. And as this week's cartoon shows, there's nothing startling in the report about government's response to the July 2021 civil unrest. But without a visible rooting out of those responsible, the risk of a repeat performance remains. We hope you enjoy this week's edition of Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, the magazine that offers you news about developments in the real economy. Happy reading and see you next time. Great, right, thank you, Engineering News. So proud to have you with the Transport Forum. We really appreciate your alliance. Right, ladies and gents, let's have a look at our sponsors. Um, our first one here is our platinum sponsor, C Track. Is there somebody from C Track want to say a few words? C Track's actually been part of the Transport Forum since inception almost 15 years ago, uh, making um, you always visible, your assets, your moving stock, um, what's happening in the cabin of your vehicles and so on, and uh, fleet management solutions. I think definitely, if you're not uh, part of C-Track and making use of their technology, uh, you're definitely not visible, and that's so important nowadays. So thank you very much, C-Track, for your platinum sponsorship. We really appreciate that. University of Johannesburg, uh, been part of the transport as well from from start. Uh, Prof. Jackie Walters, Prof. Nadine Pisa, and them, and uh, they the gold sponsor to the transport forum, playing a big role in mentoring myself. They also host four events per year with the transport forum. This club internationally endorsed training programs and local accreditation. Rather than having them as a gold sponsor with us. And you can see there all the uh, training and, and uh, accreditation they offer. Um, very proud having them on board and Visco. Is there somebody from Visco perhaps I want to say a few words? I'm doing all the work again this morning. Verde Cargo, that's a leading cargo airline providing express airport to airport solutions and the related services to the courier and express logistics industry. Thank you, but if but they call for your gold sponsorship. Zatari, somebody from Zatari. Zatari Impact Engineer, Consulting Engineers, as you can see in those pictures. Previously, Oricon, part of the Transfer Forum, was gold sponsor for many years. Ability, Human Place of Insurance, gold sponsor. Niche insurance products, commercial insurance underwriters, bus and coach insurance specialists. Thank you, Ability. And also in the risk services, one of South Africa's largest independent brokers, offering personal business and special risk and insurance advisory services. Thank you, Inve, for your gold sponsorship. Unitrans, somebody from Unitrans, perhaps? Innovation, expertise, delivery. Unitron supply chain solutions, transportation and logistics company have been unlocking the value of supply chains in various sectors of sub-Saharan economies since 1962. Pride results in establishing strategic alliances with the customers by continuing unlocking value through operation is HMT excellence. Thank you, Unitron. Global trade solution, somebody from DTS. Let me see. 
you see they were first since 1999. Um, User-friendly cloud-based international trade and supply chain solutions. Um, definitely imports and exports. This is the company to talk to. Standard Bank. Maybe Kathy wants to talk about Standard Bank. Yes, thank you so much, Harry. And um, again, once once again, the opportunity <clears throat> to participate in the Transport Forum and to be a partner is just, a, again, exceptional. And it also echoes our approach as a platform business. And then just a quick bit of news is that Standard Bank was ranked um, as Africa's most valuable banking brand in the brand finances annual ranking. So that is, am that is amazing. And we went up 17 points. And then I want to just share quickly our um, CEO, Sim Chabalala, um, you know, just want to quote what he said. Um, we're delighted by our brand's performance as it spotlights the hard work undertaking over the past few years to radically overhaul our business model, transform our customers' experiences, and we've invested heavily in disruptive technologies such as a platform business. And we so appreciate the opportunity to be part of um, the Transport Forum, which is also platform business. And in fact, we love the opportunity and we're so excited for this lineup, the program today. Another very interesting one. Thank you, Harry, and um, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you for your mentorship and assistance and support through these years. I really appreciate that, and thank you for Standard Bank for your girl sponsorship. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Kuba? Somebody from Kuba? By transforming ticketing, part of the ICM Mobility Group, which I was public and private, Transport to move into the digital era, journey planning, smart ticketing, streamlining, electronic payment, shaping the digital transformation of the mobility sector. Thank you very much, Kuba. Easy clear, somebody from Easy Clear. Software solutions for customers to get in freight forwarding and logistic providers covering AC, road, and the rail. Thank you very much, Easy Clear. For Huawei, smart transportation and a smart world for Huawei. Also, second year goal sponsor with the transfer forum and uh, delivering excellent intelligent transport solutions. JC Auditors, somebody from JC Auditors. Focusing on accredited road transport management system and international standards organization certification. Important to get your compliance in place. Thank you, JC Auditors. And then the Bunya Capital, it's a public transport knowledge hub. We spoke taxings, the insights, integrated public transport network advisory, public transport court leadership. We see the Majola, definitely the person to talk to, should you need to. Um, operate in that industry. So those are our sponsors. Let's give our sponsors a big hand. Thank you very much for making the song to call on possible. We really appreciate that. Okay, ladies and gents, let's quickly do our little fun exercise. Uh, you can win either the lantern on the left or the USB disk fan on the right of your screen and uh, sponsored by the sponsors of the transport forum uh, the lantern on the left is nice you can see it's got a solar panel on top and it's got a little thing that you can turn to charge the little battery inside um, so it can never run flat and uh, and then the desk fan you know the desk fan you plug, plug it in in your usb port so what we're going to do now is um, i'm going to ask a question and the first one that answers the question right will be the winner of that um, prize. And we're obviously going to do it twice so that we can um, you know, have our winners. And we're going to do it in, in the um, chat room. So you're going to kindly put your question in a chat room so all of us then can see whether it is the answer uh, correct. Um, so I'm just admitting more people here. All right. So let's first do the, the lantern and how it's going to work uh, we will courier the, the your prize to you we can obviously only do this for south african people um, but we will courier your prize so we will get into contact with you after the event 
you know, make sure you've got your delivering address, you know, and then we'll put your, the, your price to you. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. The first one now is for the um, lantern. And you can go to the chat room. And uh, the question now is as follows. All right, so here's the first question. I want the name of the organization who is the host of today's transport forum. What organization is the host of today's transport forum? Here we go. We've got a winner, but I can see it. Congratulations. Uh, you won that prize. All right. Then let's have a look at a second question for the desk fan, the USB desk fan. Who is, what organization? Again, organization name. Who is the host? No, sorry. Who is the platinum sponsor of the transport forum? Who is the platinum sponsor of the transport forum? There we go. Congratulations, uh, C-Track. Um, you're the winner. Uh, uh, Eugene Governor, I mean, you're the winner of that prize. So we will get into contact with you guys to uh, obtain your delivery addresses. All right, great stuff. I see Billy said they give the prize to somebody else, Harry. I think Sandra Gertema was the other one uh, that also answered correctly. Let me just quickly go back to the chat room. Yeah, Sandra Gertenbach, you're the winner of the first prize. So I will get into contact with you for your prize. Right, just your attention to the Transport Forum's uh, business directory. The business directory is very popular. We're getting very positive feedback. Uh, it's a very well categorized business directory on the transport forum website for transport related organizations to get listed. And you can look at our website, you'll see all the hits they get. It's very, very popular. We outsource this as one of our BE initiatives to Olga Mashilu for the involuntary consultants. And there's a number. Uh, you can contact her and she will be able to help you to get listed. And it's only 450 rands per year to the listing. So that's really not money. So you can contact the folder. All right, ladies and gents, the presentations today that's been made available for sharing will be uploaded to the Transfer Forums website and you're welcome to download them from there. And there's that website, transportseek.com. You need to log in, username and password on the Transfer Forums website. That website, when you go to that website, you'll get the user log into the letter to your screen. Should you not have a user log in yet, you click on sign up, you go through a simple little sign up process to create your own username and password. And then after you've done that, then you can sign in, you can log in, you go to events downloads, and it will give you your little search engine to find the presentation you're looking for. So the top one there, downloads, if you click there, you can type in a, a, a topic or a person's surname when you hit search, and it will give you all the people who presented over the past almost 15 years. Uh, you know, relevant to your search, or you can go to category and you can select the base date and hit search, and it will be today's presentations. So, as simple as that. All right, so without further ado, then uh, let's then start our exciting program today hosted by Transnet for Terminals. And we would like to introduce you to Mr. Lufuna Ralepala. You know, I think you, the person, is going to be welcome for us. And we've been honored in being hosted by you people today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh colleagues and uh, to the participant, my apologies, I was on mute. And thanks, Harry, for this opportunity. We really, really appreciate 
and we take it with uh, all the, 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 the privilege that it provides for us. The association with the forum to date has been beneficial to both us and the forum. We don't take these opportunities lightly. For us, it is indeed a, an opportunity to share uh, information with you where we are, knowing the role and uh, the, the role that we play in the economy and the role that we play in, in, your, in your businesses and in your lives. We, we are really very uh, privileged and unfortunately, Mr. Mundagi, the acting CE, would not be able to join us. He had to be called in this morning for some agent matters to attend to. And uh, I'm standing in to provide the welcome or opening remarks. As Transnet, as Transnet Port Terminal, we take the association uh, very seriously. It's a platform for us to share the information. It's a platform for us to engage. It's a platform for us to listen and get feedback, but more importantly, to collaborate with you to take this business, this industry that we find ourselves in forward. Today's topic is about reinvigorating uh, uh, for competitiveness and future growth. There's an African proverb, uh, proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. That is why we take this forum and the platform it, pre it presents to us very seriously. We want to go far. We know that where we are currently, is not what, where we want to be. We are not proud to be where we are, but it's a work in progress. We do have challenges that we are facing head on. And together with you and your contribution and your input, we believe that we can take this uh, uh, organization forward, but more importantly, improve South Africa's competitiveness and make sure that we share the economic benefits. We know that our role is to be a, a catalyst, to be an accelerator of economic growth and not, to be, and not be a binding constraint. It is therefore a, a privilege for us to take this opportunity today to share our performance to date, to share where we are, the challenges, the achievements that we have to date, as well as share with you the plans and the action that we are taking uh, to ensure that we meet your expectations. Our presentation today will focus uh, mainly starting with the uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, performance uh, state of the economy, which will be done by our uh, port authority. And then we'll then go to the transnet segment strategy, which will then share the segment strategy within which you will then you'll be able to see where the transnet port terminal fits and what the port terminal will be uh, 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 focusing on. And then in a later stage, we'll then have different regions within TPT. We've got four regions, Richards Bay terminals, Deben terminals, Cape terminals, and Saldana terminals all sharing the, 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 their performance, but more importantly, sharing their challenges as well as their action plans and the plans to address some of the pain points that you as participants and you as our customers and you as industry are facing. But we are really taking this uh, uh, platform as an opportunity to ensure that we build each other and to ensure that we take the business to another level. As we've already, as I've already indicated that we want to go far and we know it's a fact that we cannot go far alone. We need you, you need us, and we're in this together. With these few words, I'm looking forward to an open, interactive and constructive session. We'll be fully participant, we are here to listen, but at the same time, we are here to share so that you also understand where we are 
And the most the, the most important thing is that an information sharing session and information is a resource uh, that increases value with use and sharing rather than being depleted. So with these few words, I'm wishing uh, participants all the best. I'm also going to be part of the session and I'm looking forward to the engagement and I'm looking forward to all your invaluable puts. Thank you very much. Thanks, back to you, Harry. Thank you very much, Lufuno, and thank you for extending the invitation to engage with the industry. We know that you guys are open and you're demonstrating that very well through the transport forum and a platform that you're using to engage with us. Uh, collaboration sure is what it's all about. We're also making sure that this event is being um, streamed to YouTube and we also um, making sure we be doing a write-up of this event, which we will make available afterwards in about a, three or four days' time, and uh, to make sure that we have all the important information captured and we can follow up and properly engage for better South Africa. So, all right, ladies and gents, let me quickly put up our program again and, uh, and we can get going. It's a very nice event. So, our first presenter then this morning is Mr. Bukani Mukasa. He's the economic analyst, business strategy at Transnet National Force Authority. And he's going to talk about the state of the economy. Thank you, Mr. Bukani. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I will just try to project from my side. Uh, hopefully, I won't struggle to do that. Let me try. Thank you, Bukani. Uh, can you confirm if you can be able to see a slide? Yes. Uh, it's perfect, Bukani. You can continue. Okay, no, thanks a lot. Uh, good, good morning to everyone. My name is Vukani um, from the Port Authority uh, uh, at the HQ in Rebecca. I've been actually requested to present the, the economic state of the country globally because, I mean, it's one of the most uh, important uh, part of today's event and uh, sometimes you always wish to actually present a positive picture but uh, as we can understand that the situation at the current moment it really doesn't actually give us that opportunity to actually uh, present a, a, a positive picture but we remain optimistic that I mean, things will actually be better and we have a responsibility, by the way, to better the situations. And it's actually, uh, if you talk of transport and the, the port system, I mean, those are the main uh, components when it comes to the economic growth and the trade with the international uh, markets. So my presentation is actually covering both international economic developments and domestic uh, economic uh, developments uh, in terms of how the economy has actually performed uh, recently and the projections for the next few years. Uh, starting at the global uh, uh, level, then that uh, the economy is actually estimated to have recovered by 5.9%. That is the information that we received from the IMF by the 22nd of January. And that recovery was mainly driven by the reopening of the economic activities across the globe. Uh, but in the next two years, there are projections that the economy at the global level will actually moderate to 4.4% and 3.8% for 2022 and 2023 respectively. So. Uh, in terms of the regional economic developments, uh, the advanced economies uh, are estimated to have actually grown by 5% in 2021. I mean, US actually recording a 5.6% and is actually projected to actually moderate at 4% and 2.6% over the next two years, respectively. So, And if you look in terms of the world trade, it's also estimated to have actually recovered 
uh, by growing at 9.3%, which is something that is actually uh, quite uh, good. Uh, considering that the contraction that uh, the world actually experienced in 2020, it was around 8.2% uh, uh, and we have actually recovered by 9.3%. And uh, it's actually uh, estimated or projected that the trade at a global level, uh, it's forecast to actually um, further improve by 6.0% 6 and 4.9% over the next two years, respectively. So, so, which is actually painting a good picture. And it somehow gives a optimistic view as to probably we are likely to benefit uh, from that development uh, despite our own uh, internal challenges as South Africa. But when it comes to the exports, I mean, we are obviously going to benefit uh, in terms of the economic developments. The emerging markets and, and, and developing economies have also grown by 6.2% in terms of the economy in 2021, and is projected to further improve by 4.8% in 2022. India and China were the most growing economies uh, in 2021, and they are expected to further improve in the next uh, two years. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that is the, the status quo at the current moment. Well, despite the global economic uh, uh, recovery and the positive, positive outlook that is actually expected over the next uh, two years, however, there are still some risks around the COVID-related variants that we have been experiencing. I mean, COVID is something that has actually uh, sort of actually affected the, the global economy and trade and all these sectors within the economy. And the, we have been actually, really actually have a, a plan as to probably how we deal with, with those kind of challenges, but our countries have somehow have actually sort of actually improved in terms of how they deal with those, uh, including the, the 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 vaccination and the other measures that have actually put in place. Uh, other than the COVID uh, uh, risk that are likely to affect the further growth that are actually projected, uh, there are some other risks that include supply chain disruptions, uh, energy price volatility, and the localized wage pre pressures. I mean, South Africa probably is one of those countries that is always actually being affected most of the time, by the way, by those um, uh, uh, wage uh, pressures. And we've actually seen in the last week, some demonstrations around the, the operation to Dula. Uh, officially, those are some of the concerns. I mean, we hope that it's not going to probably maybe further escalate to a level that is actually not manageable. We're, we're hopeful that the leadership will be able to respond to that. So those are some of the, a risk that you are likely to sort of actually experience. Uh, this slide is trying to show a picture in terms of the economic uh, development or growth for South, comparing, comparing South Africa and the, and, the, and the world. What is actually quite important here that I'm um, trying to demonstrate is to show the gap uh, between the South African economic uh, growth and the world, which has uh, actually increased, uh, actually being widened, I mean, over a number of years and is still expected uh, to maintain that gap, which is not something that is actually quite good. Because if you are actually as a country, you are growing below the average of which the, the, the world economic growth is the, the world average, then it means that probably there's something that uh, you need to actually pay much attention into. But then by the way, that's the picture that is actually being painted or the that's the outlook that is actually being uh, expected to take place whereby a global economy is expected to grow at around the uh, average 4%. Yet our South African economy is expected to, to grow at around 1.5% uh, on average over the next two years. That's the gap that is actually uh, being shown by the, the economy in, in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the world. Uh, this slide is trying to show uh, some price changes uh, of some key commodities uh, uh, between 2021 and the forecast for 2022. You can see that in 2021, 
uh, most of the commodities, they actually recovered significantly so in terms of what happened in the previous year, whereby as uh, these commodities have actually in terms of the price improved. Uh, you can actually, I mean, look in terms of what uh, the crude oil has actually managed to perform in terms of the price commodity in that space, which has actually improved by, uh, estimated to have improved by 64.8%. If you look in terms of the coal, which is actually improved by more than 100%, iron ore, which is one of our main commodities that we actually export uh, to the likes of China and, and other Asian countries, uh, the prices actually has improved in that space uh, by 46%. Uh, but then if you look in terms of the forecast for 2022, then you can see some declines. That decline is actually not really a negative um, thing, but it's just that those prices are starting to stabilize after some significant um, uh, recovery that actually took place uh, in the last year, which is 2021. So a number of those commodities, uh, when it comes to their price, uh, they are actually expected or are forecast to somehow decline just to stabilize uh, after the uh, uh, strong uh, recovery that actually took place last year. So then the, the, the measure uh, commodity prices, uh, yes, I've actually mentioned that they are actually expected to actually recover or further recover. And if you look in terms of the crude oil, which has actually uh, improved uh, in, in the last year by about 65%, coal in terms of South African coal, which is actually improved by 80% in terms of the price, iron ore also improved by 46%, which was actually something that was quite good for the exporters when it comes to especially the coal and iron ore. But when it comes to the crude oil, I mean, for South African market or economy, it's something that is actually not that much actually positive because we're not net importer of the crude oil. So meaning that if the prices of the uh, commodities that we import are actually increasing, then it's actually uh, being uh, having some adverse effects in terms of our economic growth. But uh, we just hopeful that uh, those um, uh, commodity prices, they will be able to stabilize so that uh, we are able to sort of actually improve our trades. This slide is actually showing the economic growth of South Africa and the projection for the next two years. But it further actually breaks down the sectoral economic uh, developments or growth over the past three quarters of 2021. And the main point here is to highlight uh, the performance by the transport industry as the function is actually or the event is about transport. You can see, I mean, for the past uh, or for the first two quarters of 2021, the transport sector has actually significantly improved or recovered uh, whereby in the first quarter, the transport sector actually grew by 4.8% on a quarterly basis. In the second quarter, it actually grew by 6.9% as the main uh, performing sector in that particular quarter. However, in the third quarter, I mean, we can recall that our economy sort of actually declined or contracted by 1.5%. And the transport sector was also one of those sectors that actually um, experienced the negative growth. But for the consolidation of the year 2021, the expectations are that uh, they were going to actually see a overall positive um, uh, economic growth for South Africa of about 4.6% as the uh, IMF has actually estimated. And I'm um, also expecting that uh, transport will be one of the sectors that will actually show an overall positive growth, hoping that, uh, I mean, that uh, sector will be able to actually build uh, from that growth. Uh, then in, in, in terms of the, the overall performance of the South African economy, I mean, South Africa was actually among the, the economies that was mostly affected by the COVID and the uh, wish, uh, in fact, which is actually still the case. However, with the estimates of recovery of 4.6%, it shows that we have managed to sort of actually, I mean, uh, grow or grow 
uh, at least uh, more than uh, the projections that were actually uh, published by IMF in July by 0.6%. But it remains a, 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 a lower growth because, I mean, uh, considering that uh, in the 2020 uh, performance, our economy uh, contracted by more than 6%. And in 2021, if we have grown by 4.6%, uh, there is a about 2% uh, gap between that, which means that we have been actually fully recovered from the, 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 the construction from the contraction that we experienced in 2021. But then it actually requires the key economic sectors to somehow actually make sure that uh, we do our level best to actually try to improve in, in that space. Uh, and they have actually mentioned that uh, the projections are uh, that we are going to actually grow at a moderate rate of about 1.5% uh, on average over the next uh, two years, which is something that is quite not on par with the rest of the world when it comes to the economic development. And it's actually one of the most concerning um, uh, uh, situations that our economy is unable to actually fully recover. Then coming to the micro performance or microeconomic performance, uh, we have seen uh, some significant improvements in terms of those micro and, and economic performance areas. Uh, petrol prices, the rand uh, uh, dollar exchange, uh, the price uh, of the of the crude oil, the CPI and the PPI. And the report rate that we can recall that um, in last month in the Reserve Bank, they increased the report rate by um, a 25 uh, uh, point basis, which is something that is actually really going to sort of actually affect the bond owners. But in a nutshell, those improvements are not really actually good when it comes to the so-called the cost of doing business and the cost of living for the South Africans, because now uh, most of the companies, if you may recall, is that they've actually freeze the salary adjustments. And if these microeconomic indicators are actually improving, then it's actually uh, something that is actually having some adverse impact in terms of the livelihood of those people. And it's actually affecting the cost of doing business, which is something that has been actually being communicated by government that we need to actually try by all means to actually lower the cost of doing business because it actually hinders the development of the, of the country. And if you look in terms of the, the petrol, which is something that is actually one of the main concerning areas when it comes to the micro economic performance of the country. In 2021, on average, a liter of a petrol has actually increased to reach uh, 17 rand and 57 cents uh, compared to 15 rand 74 uh, cents, which is something that was actually seen in 2019. That was actually something that was actually quite not good for, for the economy. And if you look in terms of the oil price, uh, which actually averaged 69 point, uh, sorry, 69 dollars and seven cents per barrel in 2021 compared to 41, at dollars uh, 26 cents per barrel in 2020, then you can see that there was an increase. And the, being a net importer of the oil, then it actually have some negative effects in terms of our economy. The rand exchange, I mean, there has been some gain in terms of the strength, uh, which is actually something that is actually positive for the importers uh, from South Africa, that if the rent is strengthening, at least you are able to actually buy more in terms of these uh, goods that are actually being imported. And the, the recent increase in terms of the interest rates, which was actually increased by 25 basis points, is something that, well, is actually not sitting well with the bond owners because, yeah, we are going through some financial difficulties uh, as, as South Africans. Coming to uh, uh, logistics performance, this is the actually some logistics uh, performance indexes that have been published by the, the World Bank. Uh, this is the recent report, uh, which is actually published in 2018. I think the, 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 the other report will be published, uh, if I'm not mistaken, probably this year or next year. But this is the status quo at the current moment, whereby in the overall um, LPI, which is the logistic performance indicator, we're actually performing uh, bad, if I may put so, 
uh, because we have somehow declined in most of the elements within the LPI. And this is actually uh, aligned with the recent reports that have been published by the likes of World Bank, where we are being assessed in terms of the efficiencies and South African, particularly in the port system have been actually ranked uh, at the bottom of the, the world rankings, which is something that is quite not good in terms of a country that is still recovering and is actually at the developing stage in terms of the, its economy. But then it obviously requires all the stakeholders in the logistic evolution to actually play their part to also, in fact, to improve the status quo of the, of the situation. So that's the uh, negative picture that the world report is actually showing in terms of the logistic uh, performance uh, indicators. Uh, South Africa, in terms of the trade, uh, there has been some recovery, strong recovery uh, that the country is actually has experienced in 2021 uh, by the IMF uh, report, uh, whereby both uh, export and import have actually improved significantly so to recover from the previous declines. Uh, but in the next uh, five years, there are projections that, I mean, the imports will on average improve by 7%, uh, while the exports are likely to improve by 2.8% uh, over the next five years. But we remain hopeful that we will be able to better the performance, especially around the exports, obvious to leverage on the uh, economic developments that are actually taking place uh, globally so that we are able to actually export more goods to those countries. This slide is just actually showing the, the, the investment by South Africa, uh, which is a, a, a percentage of GDP and the, um, actually being comparing this uh, performance of the South African investment yeah, with the advanced economies, sub-Saharan Africa and the emerging markets and developing economies. And you can see that on average over the past decade, South Africa has actually, uh, the investment as a percentage of, of GDP has been uh, very low at around 7.3%, which is something that is actually very low and were below compared to the other um, economies that have actually used as a comparison. And the, uh, for the outlook, uh, the investment as a percentage of GDP is actually expected or is projected uh, to further actually lower at around 15.4%, uh, which is actually a percentage of a GDP. And that's quite concerning considering that uh, we have a challenge of infrastructure development and some aging infrastructure that we are actually having uh, that needs to be actually uh, considered with some agent attention if you want to actually grow our economy. Then this is just a breakdown of the investment conference that took place in 2020 whereby uh, about uh, 109 billion rand was being actually committed by a number of, of, of sectors uh, that are actually listed there that they will commit. But obvious, I mean, there are some enablers that needs to be actually taken care, especially by a number of st stakeholders, including the, the transport sector in order to sort of actually materialize these investment pledges that were being actually committed. So we hope that these investment commitments at some point, they will actually be effected and implemented so that the South African economy improves. Uh, then just to summarize some of the key points that were actually part of the uh, SONA that was actually delivered by the president uh, a week ago. And I'm um, just actually uh, just highlighted some key points that I felt that probably actually might be actually relevant for this forum. Uh, there has been a hundred billion uh, that has been allocated for the infrastructure fund over the next uh, 10 years, uh, which we hope that is going to improve a number of areas, including probably the, the, log the, log the infrastructure that is actually required to improve uh, the logistic evolution in our country and obvious and the other sectors of the economy. And the, that infrastructure fund, the obvious, they, they are going to actually partner with some SOEs uh, to prepare a pipeline of projects 
in terms of the investment. And there is about 21 billion rand that was actually being uh, um, uh, uh, set aside for the Catholic projects that are actually expected uh, to be constructed for, for this year. And there are a number of other initiatives uh, in terms of the bulk infrastructure just to unlock the 133 billion rand by the private investment, which is something that is actually quite good uh, to sort of actually look into that. And uh, also to include or to actually include the, the, the rural economic development, there are a number of projects that the, the president has actually mentioned that uh, needs to actually be implemented so that we make sure that the rural economy is actually being inclusive of the mainstream economies. And there are a number of actually other projects that the yeah, president actually highlighted. And we are hoping that the Minister of Finance, when he's actually delivering the, the budget uh, uh, speech tomorrow, he's going to actually provide some details around these uh, kind of commitments. And that will actually be something that is actually great in order to actually improve our economy. Just to conclude uh, for, for the economic uh, uh, developments uh, at a country level specifically, I mean, obviously, obvious touching base to the global because we're also actually part of the global economy. Uh, the global economy and the trade outlook, it remains uh, in positive. And I've mentioned that it also it remains vulnerable uh, to a number of risks, including the variants within the COVID and the other number of actually uh, risks that have actually been identified. And the South African economy is also expected to sort of actually uh, grow, I mean, at a positive rate, but it will remain at a low or one of the lowest or least growing economies over the medium term, which is actually something that is quite concerning. And the South African economy is actually projected to maintain a positive growth, but it's remain, it remains vulnerable to the economic, or oh, sorry, the COVID uh, uh, new variants that uh, from time to time we do uh, actually experience. But we hope that uh, the government will actually be proactive in terms of the mechanisms and the plan and measures to sort of actually maybe to actually uh, make sure that our economy doesn't actually further actually being affected by the, the COVID as it has been the case in the previous two years. Uh, the trade volumes in terms of the performance are expected to actually benefit uh, particularly leveraging on the global uh, positive growth that is actually expected over the uh, number of two years. And the trade uh, also needs to maintain the consistent positive uh, growth uh, for a full recovery uh, in terms of our performance. But then there is a need uh, to accelerate. Uh, I mean, some infrastructure, I've just mentioned here uh, some port developments because there is quite a number of initiatives that are actually taking place uh, at, at TNPA, uh, TPT, and the other Transnet ODs in, in terms of the investment in, in that space. So there is a need of accelerating those projects, uh, hope, hoping that the number of other uh, uh, bottlenecks that are likely to delay some of these projects will be somehow being given a special attention that they deserve. And there is a, also a need to facilitate and implement actions and plans to lower the cost of doing business because that's the key message whenever the president is actually talking about the economy. I don't think that he finishes his speech without actually touching base on the importance of lowering, lower, lowering the cost of doing business. And I think uh, this forum uh, in terms of its, stake, uh, its stakeholders, it's quite key and an important uh, component to actually play in that role. Chair, let me stop from there. Probably I uh, will take some comments later on and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bukhani, for a well researched and well prepared presentation. We really appreciate your time in preparing and sharing this with us. Um, kindly stay with us after the next presentation. We're going to have a questions and answers session. Uh, in which you kindly will be available you know, to answer questions. We really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, let's keep an eye on the chat room. Thank you very much for that. Ladies and gents, let's bring up our program again. 
our next presenter then this morning is Mr. Kozo Radebe. This is the GM, GM strategy delivery for Transnet Group. And she's going to talk about the group strategy segmentation strategy. Thank you very much, Mr. Kozo. Um, good morning to all the stakeholders and the colleagues that are joining us today. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I share the presentation? Sorry, I joined uh, at the tail end of Ghana's presentation. Yes. Um, I, I had to kill another uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, do I share from my side? Yes, um, yes please. Okay. Yes, okay. Please. Let Let's try doing that, and then. No rush, we're okay. we waiting okay, for you, but no rush. Let me kill the first, the, the, the second screen. Oh, can you see it now? No, no, unfortunately not. Green share screen at the bottom of your screen. Okay, let me just kill the second screen. I think it's complicating my life. <laughs> it <can be laughs> I, thought I, I thought I will be smart and use two screens, but it's not working out well. Okay, are we Perfect. fine? Perfect, okay. thank you. And and thank you for, for, for your patience uh, in me setting up, okay? Uh, my name is Nondogo Zohatebe from Transnet uh, with the group uh, strategy team. And thanks for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. As I indicated, I just joined um, at the tail end, and, but uh, the, the presentation uh, that Fugani did at least his conclusions they do sort of uh, talk to what I, I will share uh, with, the, with the audience. I've been asked as a part of the context, um, just to set up, uh, just as a set, as a context setting, just to take you through Transnet's um, segment strategies, which do take a view of medium to long-term of where Transnet uh, should be in terms of um, the organizational reform, developing capacity, and overall repositioning uh, Transnet in the medium to, to, to long term. Indeed, the operation side, which uh, my colleagues will go into detail later on, are also uh, part of this, but a stepping stone on, on the segment and strategies. So I will not necessarily uh, touch on that. So the, the, the first part of the slide, what we're trying to demonstrate here, it's the complications um, that we have because of the geographic spread uh, of uh, our country. You find that um, we have the economic hub, which is housing in this instance in the inland, but uh, a number of other economic activities is sort of uh, spread um, in the different nodes uh, in the country, which then has a complication that uh, South Africa then it's a transport uh, intensive economy because you have to move goods in and out to different parts and depths of the country. Same with the agriculture and manufactured goods from the production areas trying to get them to the ports as well as uh, the bulk commodities, which are also mined uh, a bit out of uh, more into the inland area, and then they have to move to our uh, seaports. This definitely then says that we do have to have quite a reliable and um, effective uh, transport and logistics system in the country to, to service all of this. And indeed, having said that, we do have weaknesses in our logistics system. Uh, we have been raised, let me try, okay. Um, we, we have been um, ranked, there are so many studies that we can quote uh, that uh, transport and logistics sector in uh, South Africa is ranked second least competitive. So everything that we are trying to do, uh, repositioning Transnet, is working on those bases that we have to improve our competitiveness. We have to reduce costs, uh, logistics costs, and we have to provide the supporting uh, infrastructure as required. 
So the role of Transnet in um, South Africa is very critical in enabling the intensive economy and overall economic activity that uh, is quite significant and communicated in a number of plans. The recent one being the economic recovery and reconstruction a plan that Vugani also touched on. We have to facilitate industrialization, especially, especially with the focus on um, the manufacturing as the key enabler of uh, economic recovery. The trade uh, facilitator with the minerals, we are quite endowed with uh, minerals and agriculture in the country. We therefore have to make sure that those um, reach uh, the other global um, economies uh, and we benefit from them. We have to enable industrial growth and development, especially we've seen in the mining sectors that we've got a number of um, emerging miners that are contributing to industrial growth and development that we have to um, also uh, uh, cater for. Crowding a private sector uh, capital we know the state of the infrastructure, uh, the confidence levels in our economy, which then as the SOE, we have to uh, use the little that we have, drawing the partnerships and, and, and crowd in private sector so that we can leverage a number of skills and, and, and capital to drive key infrastructure uh, programs. And then ensure global competitiveness. This we cannot uh, stress enough. We know that in most of the commodities that we supply, be it coal, iron ore, and manganese, and chrome to a certain extent as well. Uh, South Africa is either we are the leader or part of the top five. And therefore, we have to make sure that uh, we maintain that uh, global competitiveness, especially for our bulk commodities. So that's why uh, then um, we had developed this strategy that is called Transnet as Segment Strategy to drive all of these enablers uh, that we've identified going forward. Please tell me if I'm uh, talking a bit uh, slow and you want to, uh, to speed up, me to speed up. So in, in that essence, we have adopted a new approach to our business model. Indeed, we have a uh, Transnet port terminal, we have uh, TFR, but we've sort of taken a, a different view to say, let's look at from it from a segment perspective or a commodity perspective. What is the commodity that we are supporting from the logistics perspective? Um, looking at it from an integrated commodity supply chain versus the divisional or modal uh, service offering. That way that allows us to have interventions or initiatives or um, programs that deal with the whole integrated commodity supply chain that is required for iron ore, for a container uh, in, in, in the space of uh, uh, particularly uh, the, the ports in, in, the, in, in, the, in the natural, uh, the containers, what is required from uh, driving the competitiveness of crop. This is what we mean by the segment strategy. So we are not looking at it at what TFR does or what TPT it does, but the commodities. What are the key commodities that uh, Transnet is supporting, which more or less are a, generate 80% of our revenue within those commodities? What are the supply chains that we need to address holistically uh, from pit to port, as we will call it? So we've sort of grouped these commodities into two broad portfolios. We've got bulk commodities, where Transnet relatively uh, has a competitive advantage, uh, moving uh, bulk commodities, we're doing uh, quite well. And then industrial sectors, where we would say we might not necessarily uh, that competitive uh, in, in the case of containers, and therefore, those require value chain optimization um, in, in that instance. So this is how we are uh, looking at it. Um, at the key of that is that we partner where it is mutually beneficial to support the growth uh, ambitions in those uh, key sectors. Partnership, it means a lot of things. I know that a lot of is said about uh, PSPs in the newspapers, in the media about Transnet, but partnership is a lot of things. It can be from uh, capital, uh, sourcing capital, working together on operational improvements, 
partnering with clients on, on some of their um, initiatives in the value chain. It, it, it's a lot of things. It does not necessarily mean it's, it's just equity and, um, or, um, and uh, getting operational uh, partners into our space, but a range of partners. We even partnering with the uh, government for some of the initiatives, we're partnering with the DFIs uh, to support us uh, with uh, both capital and also um, uh, uh, skills in some of the work that we are doing. So that's the nutshell, the segment strategy, focus on the segments, uh, continue to do well and optimize the, the bulk commodities and uh, uh, optimize the value chain from the industrial sectors with uh, partners who are mindful that our balance sheet is quite limited at this point in time. So these are the nine commodity segments that we are uh, talking about, uh, which are key. As you can see, most of them have quite a significant contribution in terms of uh, our economic value, as well as um, employment. But maybe to just zoom into agriculture, containers, automotives, those are the ones that uh, really grow in excess of forecasted GDP at this point in time, which are the ones that we say we need to. We're not doing so well and we really have to optimize uh, the value chain while the iron, while the, um, the mining, uh, the, the bulk commodities. On the other hand, we have to be mindful that um, we have to be competitive. Some of them, the market outlook like coal, they will start uh, declining, but up until that point, we have to maintain our uh, competitiveness. So the next slide, and these are the initiatives uh, that are associated with those uh, uh, commodities, the nine that I've highlighted. I know it looks a bit uh, overwhelming, about 20 initiatives, but if we go back to the principle that it's all about integrated uh, supply chain, so you don't touch just one part of it. In some instances, we have to look at, um, from the rail side, we have to look at the port side, we have to look at the inland terminals, example being the very first one, the auto. We are trying to create um, a double port system where we know that Devon is the key port for autos, but we trying to see if we can also maybe optimize the ports in the Eastern Cape uh, uh, port of uh, Elizabeth and East London is also secondary uh, ports that are saving um, um, channels. Let me talk about channels that are saving the auto space. But in doing that, we also have to, so there's a rail um, corridor that we have to look at. We also have to look at the inland terminal, which is the Calfontaine in this instance, and the ports themselves in terms of optimization, which is why then you'll see that we've got a number of initiatives is because we are looking at the whole uh, value chain. And these are at different uh, stages. We started this uh, focus on segment strategies probably about 16 months uh, or so. They are at different stages, but suffice to say that most of them, we are in early stage uh, development where we're still looking at uh, finalizing towards the business cases. Um, these are overall progressing well, as I said, uh, that uh, we've been in this journey for about 16 months or so. We are accelerating certain initiatives and partnerships. The key focus areas is really to restore the rail and port asset base and improve utilization, prioritize the investments towards growth and in high margin uh, flows and the ones that are uh, important for the country. Uh, Okay, what is that red text now on the screen? Okay. Uh, so in accelerating, so we've sort of uh, separated them into two, but they, they, they are linked really. They are not, they are not um, uh, mutually exclusive. We said, let's in the short term, let's focus on the ones that improve operational and financial position uh, for Transnet that have high impact uh, and align to the strategy. In a way, they fund the chain, the long-term chain. 
and uh, the second bucket being the growth and renewal uh, type of medium to long initiatives. Those are the ones that uh, develop capacity and reposition transnet in the long term. Now, the uh, next slide is where we go through these um, segments slide by slide, but I will be very, very short because some of the context I've already provided in, in the previous slides. The first one is automotive. Uh, we hear the gist of it is to support the significant uh, OEM investments in automotive sector, linking to the automotive uh, master plan that was, I think, um, adopted probably 2014 or 15, I can't remember which year. We've seen a number of um, commitments from the OEM, I think about 40 billion or so, uh, Ford, Mercedes and, 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 and VW and, and the likes, and we've even seen uh, the likes of bike coming in, into the country. And therefore the gist of it is how do we support them? And I did say that one of the ways we said we can do that is to, um, while we have Deben as the key port for automotive sector, it makes sense as well in terms of um, uh, uh, cost, and uh, the cost of the logistic that side, but can we also create secondary and optimize secondary port, uh, channels that can uh, support a Deben? And therefore, in this instance, we're looking at uh, Port of Elizabeth and East London. Currently, um, from the port terminal capacity, we are exporting about 805,000 uh, FPUs. And after the interventions uh, in Deben, Port of uh, PE and East London, we're looking at about 1,430 uh, million FBUs in about five or six years or so. And we've indicated that we will likely to reach that by 2029. 20, uh, this bodes well with the automotive master plan as I indicated, which was looking at about a million or so of FBUs uh, in a year understanding that the capacity, we will not reach 100% capacity, we do, but we are planning around 1,420. The first one is uh, the rail, uh, which we are planning from Gauteng down to Eastern Cape to East London in this particular instance. We call it a project Selela. It's one that is also receiving uh, quite a lot of media attention because it was part of the SONA announcement last year and effort uh, has made a several announcement on this. At this point in time, we've just finalized uh, the, the, we, the, we are busy with the technical, we've finalized the pre-feasibility. We're just finalizing uh, the, the, the viability side, working with the IDC. And then we will go to uh, feasibility and probably start um, construction if it is a feasible and preferred option from uh, sometime next day, taking us to 26, March 2026 for completion. And number two is the revitalization that we're doing around the key uh, inland terminal linked to autos, uh, which is uh, Calfontaine. There we're driving uh, the operational uh, improvements better integration between road and rail on uh, the automotives and uh, efficiencies. And then I've touched on the port terminal capacity just to see uh, as well from the port, what can we do to also improve uh, the, the capacity and also look at value added, uh, additional and value added services, which we've seen that from benchmarks, it's quite a, um, a best practice to do and OEMs, they really appreciate it. The container segment uh, strategy, I think the big thing here that um, uh, is currently out is the work that we're doing to really reposition Port of Devon as the hub uh, port. Uh, and we have started with a DCT uh, Pier 2, where we have a PSP in progress. I think we've just gone to market RFQ about a week ago on the 11th, uh, we went for RFQ. We went for RFI sometime last year, we received quite a lot of interest, uh, which has helped us now to say, let's take it to the next step, which is now a more um, bidding process, which is uh, the RFQ. There we're looking to drive uh, the volumes output uh, throughput out. I know here we are um, reflecting 
11 million TEUs. It's something that we're thinking about in the next 10 years or so. But for now, it's just to uh, move uh, towards uh, 2.4. Sorry, I can't remember the exact figure, uh, but my colleagues from TPT will uh, remind me of what is the exact capacity that we are looking at. Um, and at the same time, the intervention is in Devon. Uh, we understand that uh, that's the, because it's the hub port, we have to do as much as we can. We are rejigging a number of things. Uh, you will see it in, in, in the master plan, but I don't, if it's discussed today, uh, but at the same time, we are not forgetting about other container uh, ports uh, that are also in, in, in the country like Cape Town, where we have to increase, we're planning to increase from 1 million TEUs to 1.4 uh, TEUs, especially to support the agricultural sector in that space. Um, and then PE, and then, then Buha, which we are positioning it as a transshipment uh, hub, Indeed, it uh, currently as small as it might be compared to uh, Deben uh, container terminals, we see a lot of transshipment um, containers coming through or going through Nguha, which is now we then want to optimize it and just make sure that uh, we, we, we improve its, its, its um, efficiencies in that space. That will also mean that we have to close down the PE and move all the container related work to, to Moha. It would not make sense to keep those two ports um, open. There is it um, on the container. I've touched on the port of Deben. I've touched on the transshipment uh, uh, and the, the Cape Town from the agricultural side, as well as the rail vitalization on what we usually, we used to call a natal corridor, we call it a container corridor now. We, we understand it's still intermodal, but a bulk of it uh, that is transported through that container, uh, through the corridor, it's containers. There's a lot that is uh, happening, including the recent announcement on third party access, which we want to pilot in that corridor as part of rail revitalization and third party um, access. And currently we are finalizing the guidelines, the principles of that party access and, and, and how will it will work. But as I said, it was announced for 1st of April, 2022. The next one is coal uh, segment. I think here yeah, we're not doing as much in terms of uh, capacity expansion as I indicated that some call it a sunset industry. Uh, we still have about 10 years or so until we see a serious decline. And our strategy here is uh, to protect and therefore just focusing on asset utilization uh, up until and, and, and uh, make sure that we improve coal cost competitiveness up until the time that it's uh, definite that uh, it's an, an industry that we would want to exit. So what we will want to do is if we, can, we just want to consolidate uh, all our coal via one uh, channel, which will help a lot in terms of um, improving and reducing a cost, especially for junior miners. And then um, improve the ESCOM coal logistics um, to uh, key ESCOM infrastructures, working with um, the other parties because we don't usually uh, work in this space. It's, it's, it's raw foliage in most instances but we just want to see how we can best do it, combining both the road and um, uh, working with other logistics service providers in this space to make it more efficient and uh, more uh, cost beneficial for, for ESCOM. That is it on the code. But as I said, the emphasis here is asset utilization, improving uh, performance and sustaining their competitiveness without necessarily investing in any additional capacity, I think. 81 million tons um, per annum takes us to the 10 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good cushion to take us to the 10 years without investing much in coal. Uh, iron ore, it's, uh, it's prospect still uh, promising regardless of what's happening in terms of the steel industry and China in particular. And the intention here is to increase uh, our capacity from 60 million tons per annum to 67. This will require um, the rail uh, side 
which uh, we have started with the, the studies, the planning is uh, underway. And from the port side, it will also require some interventions uh, in terms of um, the back of port facilities and the bathing capacity, especially in Saldano. But suffice to say that we are also limited by uh, the licensing requirements here, which I, I'm sure Andiso and Ed will talk about it later on. Uh, that currently we are only allowed to um, export about 60 million tons per annum. While we're looking at the infrastructure requirements from the rail and port side, we are also um, uh, have started the process to also apply for um, the license requirements that will take us to 67. We do look at 76 going forward, but for now, I think the biggest focus is just to deliver the 7 million times uh, by uh, in five years time. It also, this also accommodates a number of emerging uh, miners in, in, in this space that we've seen in the last uh, three or, or four years, which some of it is still in development and they will require um, capacity uh, to move their um, commodity once their plants are up and running. On the manganese side, it's probably one of the ones that um, is very remain optimistic, medium to long term. Um, from that, I think the big thing that we are currently looking at is uh, the world-class export uh, facility in Nuha. Currently, we export most of our manganese uh, via uh, Port Elizabeth, and the intention is to create a world-class facility in Mocha. Not only does it allow us to just ramp up the capacity from the current 9 uh, million tons to 16 uh, million tons, but it also free uh, PE for other things, for example, uh, moving the auto, expanding on the auto terminal in that side. So we have started with the planning. Uh, it does require both the rail uh, capacity expansion as well as, as the port as I have indicated. And we will also have um, port export capacity from the Saldana because we do want to move from 16 million tons to about 22 overall. And at this point in time, the manganese uh, industries have indicated that they even need more than 22, but the immediate focus is to get to 22. So the first one being uh, the Mocha that I've explained, and then some interventions to get out 1 million tons extra via our Saldana uh, export uh, channel, which links to what I said around uh, iron ore in terms of back of port uh, optimization, as well as bathing uh, capacity when necessary. But again, uh, the planning is still underway for this. The chrome um, is a growth uh, industry. We want to optimize uh, the exporting via Maputo. We've got a partnership that is going. We are even trying to strengthen our partnership with our Mapu uh, with Maputo colleagues on the other side. But we also see uh, foresee huge improvements and in, in, in investment in capacity in Richards Bay uh, dry bulk terminal. We currently at 16 million tons and hoping uh, that we will move to 26 uh, tons probably in the next three or, or four years at this point in time so that we can uh, provide the required capacity for chrome and magnetite. And we've already started, we are on the pre-feasibility business case at, at this point in time. The energy, it's, a, it's an interesting segment uh, for us uh, in that it's got an, a number of things and it's, a, it's not topical, but it's a scrutiny as also from our investors on what we are doing as Transnet from the energy perspective. And we've sort of, there are two or three things that we are looking at. The liquid fuel sector, it's still a very important uh, sector for uh, South Africa. But like coal, we know that it's gradually, it's gonna weaken uh, in the medium to long term. 
But what we are doing now is uh, focusing on maximizing the return on in assets that we have uh, invested in NMPP in that in, in particular, and also enabling new market entrants. What do we mean by that is that, unfortunately, in this space, uh, we have monopolies uh, that are controlling the value chain. And we are trying to see um, as Transnet what role we can play especially by um, establishing a, a fuel import facility, which will allow access uh, to a broader market, including um, other new market entrants and also previously disadvantaged uh, entrepreneurs that did not have capacity uh, or capital to access uh, the, this value chain. So that is what we are doing from the liquid fuels Again, uh, waiting it out, driving uh, excess and uh, securing the supply, but with an understanding that it will work in weekend in the long term, in the medium to long term. And then we are now also looking at the natural gas uh, side, as they do that, say that South Africa, we are a bit late in that, but we are doing the best we can to see uh, from the logistics side, how we can support the energy sector, the gas sector in this instance, and looking at import uh, LNG import terminals in three um, ports, which is the Richards Bay, Nuha, and Saldana. In all instances, we are at uh, early stages, but most of these projects, if all goes well, should. It seems we've lost, lost not the causa. Um, not the causa. I don't know if you can hear us. Um, your screen is frozen. Let's give a, a minute or two so that you can recover the connection. I'm quite sure she will reconnect now. Now, while we're waiting, ladies and gents, we, you're welcome to type oh, questions in the in the chat room. On the course, thank you. We can hear you. You can continue. Sorry for that. I, I yeah, I thought I would just do this on on the data card because uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi times is not reliable, and then it also failed me. But um, if we still got on about the two last... minutes left on the course, how far are you in the presentation? Yeah, that was the last slide really oh. uh, on the agriculture segment strategy. Um, um, it is, and I was emphasizing that it is quite important in terms of uh, transformation in the sector. And uh, it's one that we see also a lot of partnership. Uh, and we have started, especially with the branch line concessions, um, inland uh, terminals where we see a lot of um, put opportunities uh, for uh, partnerships and also the interventions from the port uh, terminals, which uh, the, the, the team from TPT will expand uh, more uh, later on. In a nutshell, those are the, the that's the segment strategy for Transnet uh, partners at heart, because we know that us by ourselves, we cannot uh, um, uh, do this. They ask is a lot, uh, is, is too much in terms of what is required to drive uh, the economic recovery for the country. We are constrained uh, in terms of our balance sheet and therefore our focus has to 
uh, be to sustain and maintain the network and infrastructure that we have and the partnerships is where we can have opportunities for expansion and growth of the industrial activity in the country. I will stop at that and thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you Thanks so much, Mr. Kozo. Yeah, it was well presented. Thank you so much for sharing this important strategy. Uh, can I ask Dr. Kozo that you and and uh, Lukani please switch on your cameras and and unmute uh, that we can quickly allow for questions from the audience. Um, the audience can raise their hands. They can go to the bottom of the screen for reactions, and you can do the raise hand function there, uh, and then I can recognize you so you can ask a question. So can uh, uh, can Bukhani also unmute, please? All right, I'm just bringing both of you guys in. All right, so then we have our two panelists. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, should you have a question, you're welcome to um, raise the hand. And then I will recognize you and you can ask your question uh, to our panelists. Pia Talia, Talia, you're welcome to unmute and ask. Thank you, Pia. Thank you, Harry. Um, to Nantrikozo, you see, yeah, obviously we're from, I represent Sassel in this forum. And um, we are incredibly interested in what's going to be happening on the coal, in the coal line, because we have a, a part to play not only on the coal side, but also uh, it is a major export channel for our for our bulk chemicals. Uh, and I note from the presentation that chemicals as a sector is not mentioned at all. Is it perhaps a part of a of a different sector, and or is it considered to be part of that coal line development and 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 the maintenance process around the coal uh, volumes? Uh, when you talk coal line, is it only coal or does it include all other commodities that currently feature on that line? That's my question. Thank you, Pierre. Um, the cause there's also a question from Kozi who's asking, what is the timing for the fuel facility in Durban? If you can maybe answer those two and then we'll take Sanjay's uh, question thereafter. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, uh, TFID, um, it is also planned for about 24, 25, but I'll, I'll type on the chat uh, the, the, the exact timelines. Um, sorry, I was just checking for the slide of the details of that. And then on the, if we talk about coal, we like talking, uh, we're looking at the commodity, the segment, um, not everything that moves in that line. Suffice to say that it does not necessarily mean that um, other sectors that we are servicing, like chemicals, are not going to be um, supported anymore. Uh, we will still support them. It's just that we said, let's look at the commodities that generate at least 80% value for Transnet and the country, and then put as much proactive effort in those but it's not leaving out everything else that we, 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 we still do chemicals. Um, it, it, it's still uh, important, especially, as you say, in that area with Fosco and the likes in, in the Richards Bay, it's still an, an important uh, sector, but it's not our priority segment strategies that we are zooming in, in, in into that. Um, I hope I have uh, answered it. Okay. Thank you, Nanta Kozo. Um, Sanjay, you welcome to ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good day. Um, this is Sanjay Hari Prasad. I'm calling from the U.S. Consulate uh, out in Durban. Uh, I cover the trade portfolio for the U.S. Consulate. Um, your presentation was really good, Nanta Kozo, um, and very positive regarding some of the, the strategies across the multiple sectors um, that Transnet wants to um, you know, roll out. However, I think one of the things that's uh, lurking over like a cloud is the high cube container ruling um, that government wants to proceed with, which can uh, impact, um, I think, the way and the routes in which, um, you know, some of the shipping operators 
uh, might use. Um, as you know, the high cube containers will prevent, um, you know, for automotives, um, the, 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 the movement of the vehicles uh, from the port on roads. Um, they'll have to, you know, change up to uh, a less than 20 foot container. Um, and that's very costly. And, I, you know, what we're hearing is a lot of shipping operators might bypass the ports of South Africa if, these, if this rule comes into effect and sort of go through Mozambique um, as, they, as they channel through to the rest of the continent. Um, any thoughts on that? Trying to find the button. Uh, uh, well, um, I don't have as much thought, but um, which is why uh, in, in, in our case, we're also looking at that as we're planning uh, for these uh, ports and see how we can mitigate in terms of reducing the cost in our channels to, to mitigate against uh, the, the ruling that is uh, coming uh, um, to play, as, as you have mentioned it. We will do the best we can uh, to try and, and see if we, we, how we optimize our assets, how we optimize our infrastructure, trying to bring down as much cost as we can, uh, because we know that most people are currently using a uh, road because it is cheaper. But if we try and move significant volumes via rail, it will also give us an opportunity to reduce cost in, in that uh, space. We will also um, try and uh, lobby as much of uh, stakeholders. We know shipping lines, it's not a, an easy way uh, to, to navigate, but part of that as well is uh, we also try with the likes of yourself, working with the likes of yourself, you can see that we can sell and promote and lobby for what we are trying uh, to do in terms of uh, the automotive sector, the importance of this in the country, and um, the list that we are trying. Having said that, even if they bypass, we are also looking at the developments in other uh, ports like the Maputo, um, the, the regional near, near, nearby ports. They are also unlikely to have as much capacity to carry um, um, to, to, in, in terms of the logistics. So South Africa in that instance, it does remain a critical um, enabler in, in the port uh, space. So we, we might not necessarily be able to avoid it completely. Uh, but as I say, I don't have as much um, view and uh, opinion on how we can best mitigate uh, some of these uh, global trends and global decisions that are taken. Thanks. Thank you, Nanta Kozo. Uh, Kathy, yes, please uh, add some on the iCubes. Thank you. Yes, 100%. So, so I think the question around the high cubes, and it's been a debate for many, many, many moons. So essentially at this stage, the moratorium was supposed to be extended around the high cubes, and that is for that particular registration to come into play, because essentially the 4.3 meter height restriction, that is what impacts um, high cubes by road. So it's not as if contain the industry will bypass South Africa because the containers fit onto the rail, no problem. Um, it is really around some some um, trailers that are higher than 1.5 meters from the ground and then when you put on the container it exceeds the maximum permissible height so that that moratorium is still in play the enforcement of high cube containers is not taking place so there's still that debate between government etc cetera, etc cetera. so that is not that is not legislation that um, will definitely be implemented it is part of the industry negotiation um, and and also containers are not necessarily cheaper by road um, as um, our, our um, presenter spoke, uh, referred, it's really around um, also the speed, you know, and also the safety aspect. So, you know, overnight, a particular container needs to be transported. Um, you know, there can't be any delays along the line at the moment. So, so I think it's a combination of we understand the, the centricity of certain products to be on rail, but you're also aware that there are challenges from time to time. So it's really the industry working together as a stakeholder with, with obviously TFR and TPT to make sure that product that is time sensitive, et cetera, is transported on time. So it's not necessarily cost of transport, it's really the cost overall around delays and product that doesn't get to, to um, the port on time and also potential demurrage charges. So it's really a complexity, but I think the presentation was interesting. I think so far 
the TPT and transit team have really been sharing some valuable insights, which we appreciate. But yeah, the how cube container matter, um, Harry, it is not cast in stone. It's still pretty much a debate. Um, and, and there's no enforcement that we are aware of at this point in time on high cubes at this stage. I hope I've added some value. Thanks, Harry. Added a lot of value as usual. Thank you, Cathy. We really appreciate it. Um, ladies and gents, we, we're running out of time because we want to need to take just a short break as well. I see there are nice questions still in the chat room. Obviously, we're going to have questions answered later on, so we'll also try and get to all those questions. Uh, I'm asking the, the panelists to kindly answer the questions in the chat room. That also helps a lot. And uh, and then let's see how it goes um, with the next questions and answers and so on. But kindly panelists, if you can also answer some of the questions in the chat room, or also maybe some of the other Transnet colleagues, if they can answer some of those questions, we'll really appreciate that. Um, so really appreciate that. So maybe, uh, Bukhani, I'm now quick on you. Maybe just from your side, some some closing remarks from your side for this stage. Have you got any comments from your side, perhaps? Got a closing comments? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Shay. Uh, from my side, I think it's a matter of we just actually, as a country, obviously. I mean, we need to uh, actually uh, leverage on the economic development that is actually taking place. Uh, at the current moment. And I guess probably we don't have luxury in terms of how the domestic economy is going to sort of actually improve, but then it's a matter of actually trying by all means. And the, I think that uh, the the current situation is somehow actually giving us some opportunity for the investment, whereby at the in the meantime, while there are a lot of actually a lot of economic activities that are actually taking place as we'll actually like to be, but then it so, somehow actually give us some space to actually so, somehow uh, reconfigure um, our logistics system and also invest. And I guess probably that's what Transnet is actually trying to do in terms of actually improving its infrastructure so that it can also sort of actually improve the economy of the country. So that's the message. And the, I think the other key message is that, I mean, as a transport sector, I mean, we have been given a responsibility to play a critical role in terms of actually lowering the, the cost of doing business. And the, I think we can uh, do that if we actually work together as the key stakeholders in, th in that segment. And the, I, I think that will be quite some, some positive. And the, considering that we have been actually ranked, I mean, below in terms of uh, at the bottom uh, in most of the recent studies is actually quite concerning. But I guess maybe the, the message that we sort of actually communicate with the rest of the world is something that can actually sort of actually uh, work in terms of the perception because some of the uh, 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 research or the findings sometimes you feel like probably it's based on some perceptions uh, that you are actually not doing that well when it comes to a number of things but then I mean I think the message and the close uh, collaborations with the other stakeholders I think we can be able to then send that positive message to the rest of the world that was still this Africa that it was actually regarded as the gateway to the African markets so uh, I think uh, with, with that uh, thinking I think probably we'll actually have actually done some some great developments in terms of the communications and obviously in terms of the the actually infrastructure development is a plan that is going to take some years decades to be quite honest but then it's a matter of the message that we actually communicate that it probably need to be aligned and be an optimistic one in terms of actually trying to uh, convince uh, the world that we are aware of the current challenges and you are very mindful of all those challenges and we are actually doing something in order to actually improve uh, this situation. Uh, thank you, Jay. Very important. Uh, thank you, Bukhani. Really appreciate that. Dr. Koza, you have perhaps some closing remarks? Um, thanks. I, I didn't know I can't uh, type on the chat. I was trying to respond to some of the questions which remain and uh, not answered, but uh, um, the team really will, will provide uh, the comments, um, uh, the responses to some of the co comments that we have received in the, in the chat. Yeah, there's no um, block, so I don't know why can't you type. There's something funny going on because there's no block to type. But yes, your closing comments, thank you. 
Yes, yes. And, and, and thanks again. Uh, thanks uh, for your indulgence. Um, we know that things are not easy. This has been a lot. And I see on the chat as well that um, there is a need to address other issues, other immediate uh, banning uh, pain points in, in our system as Transnet, which um, the way this has been set up, the session, it allows to do both. Um, allows us to give you a, a broader view of we will ad address the immediate pain points, but we understand that we have to do uh, far more in terms of uh, um, creating capacity, repositioning uh, Transnet, which is where I, I came from. But uh, we are not sleeping. Uh, uh, contrary to maybe some of the, we are not uh, sleeping. I've never seen such a complex. I'm relatively new at Transnet, seven months, eight months. I've never seen such a, a complex uh, animal and people that are so dedicated to do the best we can um, certainly partnerships uh, we welcome, which is the, uh, the, the gist of the discussions and the initiatives that we have presented to walk the journey, uh, to also share a number of uh, best practices because we cannot reach in a number of corners. If there's things that you want to share on how things are done in other areas of the world, we appreciate that the suggestions and we also trying as much to also reach out to the stakeholders on what we are trying to do. And if you want us to come and, and discuss it further, we're also uh, willing to do that. But thank you for, for, for the indulgence. Thank you, for thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nanta uh, Kozo. We really appreciate uh, you and Rukani's inputs. Hopefully you can stay so a little bit longer on the event. Um, and we look forward to working with you guys in the future. Thank you for, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. Ladies and gents, we're going to do a, a, a short uh, break now and uh, five minutes. So quickly go and grab that cup of coffee, cup of coffee, and we'll see you in five minutes' time again. Thank you very much.
Okay, okay, colleagues, let's uh, take up our positions again so that we can start. Let's get the screen sorted right out here. <clears throat> That's better. Right, ladies and gents, we're going to continue. Uh, we start talking about transport terminals, trans, transnet for terminals, reinvigorating for competitors and future growth. 22nd of February 2022, uh, proudly being hosted by transnet for terminals. So, our next presenter then will be Mr. Lufuna Ralipada, the general manager, corporate services of transnet for terminals, and he's going to talk to, to, to us about the TPT strategy. Pigmentation strategy, the TPT value drivers. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, yes, we can see it. You can just you can just go to slide mode. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Harry. Uh, thanks, uh, colleagues. Excellent, you can uh, continue, thank you. Okay, so from a uh, uh, non-trust presentation, our focus from an OD perspective is going to be a little bit different. We are guided, our strategic approach as TPT, as a division within Transnet, we are guided by the segment strategy philosophy, uh, which, Nontra has shared with you across all the different uh, divisions, the rail, uh, the port, both the, the, the authority as well as the operator and other divisions in terms of the pipeline and the like, uh, covering all the commodities that Transnet uh, uh, moves. So I would therefore not touch on the uh, uh, issues of the growth and uh, which are then driven by strategic, I mean, by segment strategy philosophy. Uh, the partnerships that uh, uh, Nonto has touched on, on the containers and, and uh, also on the, 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 the bulk. I would then focus as TPT on the, what, uh, we've got three drivers, which I'm still going to touch on, which is the growth, the efficiency, as well as the financial. And I will drive on the efficiency because that then talks to the questions that uh, uh, the participants are raising to say, what now? We see all the plans in terms of the uh, growth that uh, Nondro has touched on uh, from a segment strategy, which are basically exploratory and future oriented the, the, what the participant and the colleagues would be interested in, which, which uh, we're going to focus on now. With this presentation and the presentation that will come later with the specifics that the, the, the participants are, are raising in the chat in terms of, are you thinking of this? Are you thinking of RFID? Are you thinking of uh, all other stuff, the issue of the weather and the like? Those will touch them when we deal with the uh, a presentation at a, at a terminal or region level. Uh, but what we are going to do and what I'm going to do is just to set a scene in terms of what are the focus area and what is it that we're, we're looking at and, and what informs the, the decisions of those focus areas. Uh, I mean, if you look at, at, at uh, uh, the strategic choice framework, we're very clear on what drives the choices that we're making. 
we are looking at the profitability and the returns to be sustainable as a business like any other business. We don't depend on the state and we don't want to burden the state. We look at the, 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 the volumes and the revenues, but more importantly, we look at uh, operational efficiency to meet customers. So we are, we, need to, we are customer driven. How do we meet the demands and the expectation of our customers? And we agree that at this stage, we might not be uh, uh, necessarily meeting the customer needs, but that's what drives us when we make the choices. And we also look at the license obligations and standard uh, requirements from the Port Authority uh, to ensure that we deliver on those, more so to ensure that because whatever has been said by the Port Authority is to unblock uh, the economy and make the economy to perform better. Vukan is tasked from the Port Authority on the issue of uh, 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 the container performance index and also the issue of inefficiencies, which we all that all of us who are here acknowledge that they are inefficient and they need to be addressed and not today and not tomorrow, but as in yesterday. And that's what we are going to share with you. We will share, uh, which is my focus area, the areas that we're focusing on, and then the specifics the region will then share and we will be welcoming also input and we really welcome input and the question that we raise because those are the ones that then make this engagement fruitful. We then look at the port master plan which look at the future development and the long-term development of a, a, a specific a region, uh, uh, both the, uh, the economic, local economic development region uh, and regional economic development. Those then also inform uh, the strategic choices that we make because the Port Authority gives you a long-term view in terms of their plan informed by the uh, long-term framework, long-term planning framework, which then informs also uh, uh, the, all the terminal operators, not only TPT, but all the terminal operators. For instance, your master plan, uh, uh, Deben uh, master plan, to indicate that we want to create, as the authority, they want to create the what we call the Deben and a uh, uh, container hub and that then has got an impact and, 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 and influence the strategic choices that TPT as, as the terminal operator would then need to look at and then adjust to respond to those needs that are coming from the portmaster uh, plan. And then uh, importantly for us is also how do we al align to the economic sector needs? And, and these uh, are some of the criteria, critical criteria that we take into consideration uh, when we are doing the analysis of the terminals, the, the, the performance of the terminals, and what do we do next in terms of strategic choices. And then the next step, uh, uh, Nonto has touched on is the segment. So for all those segments that uh, Nonto has touched on, what we are looking at from a TPT perspective is to improve efficiency looking at uh, issues like uh, planning and execution, uh, looking at a uh, 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 maintenance regime, a big problem, a sore point for us. Uh, we're looking at the processes that are, are cumbersome and then they eat on our time in terms of the turnaround and the delays that then you see, the congestion that you see. Uh, we look at the technology adoption, we will then touch at a high level some of the stuff that we're looking at uh, addressing the issues of weather uh, attempting to address the issues of weather in Cape Town, both from the Port Authority perspective, what they've done, and what then uh, the, the terminal operator is looking at. Uh, challenge of, 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 of uh, people issues, related issues, uh, the supply chain for us, governed by the public uh, sector frameworks, is a, a, a big uh, a sore point for us at this stage. And then we'll look at, at, at growing the business value in terms of the collaborations, uh, non has touched on, but also collaboration uh, back of port. Uh, uh, we're looking at op uh, opportunities there. Uh, value chain, we're looking at an ecosystem value chain uh, opportunities that we can then look at and, and, and con uh, uh, linking both the, 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 the uh, ensuring that we are delivering on both the vertical and horizontal 
strategies. But uh, more important from financial sustainability, we need to make sure that each terminal, which is what we have adopted since last year, each terminal is a business. Uh, we need to make sure that we run it as a, a business entity independent of the other, so that they can then be run on a profitable uh, uh, basis to ensure that if there are any, we cut those uh, 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 cross-subsidization and, and that each terminal must be able to stand on its own and be able to deliver a, a value that it has, uh, it has been is supposed to, to, to deliver. We then look at the customer promise fulfillment, which at this point is, a, is an issue for us that we need to uh, address uh, uh, urgently, make sure that we deliver on time and make sure that we proactively engage with uh, our customer and we involve our customer along the whole process in terms of the delivery of our services. And uh, it's an area that we're going to focus and spend more time on that one, on how then do we improve the lines of communication that different industry forums that we're engaging on, but we need to do more in terms of streamlining those and be able to deliver on those. Now, TPT value drivers, very clear growth drivers. We need to grow our, 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 our uh, uh, business. We, like any other business, we aspire to, to, to be uh, at a certain uh, level in terms of what do we aspire to be in terms of the revenue that we generate and, and, and make sure that uh, we deliver on both developmental mandate that government uh, as a state-owned enterprise has, has, has given us. Uh, Nondra has touched on that one. And like I've indicated, towards the end of this uh, uh, presentation, I'll just touch from TPT on different terminals, uh, what we're looking at, which Nondra has touched at a high level. Uh, if I have enough time, I'll be able to touch on that. But uh, our focus today, uh, colleagues and, and, and everyone online, our focus today is on efficiency. How do we unlock uh, a value via uh, efficiency gains? What do we need to do to, 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 to improve our performance such a manner that those efficiency gains we then pass on to our customers? We improve in terms of the turnaround times. We improve in terms of the uh, uh, ship turnaround, the moves that we make. And, and make sure that we don't unnecessarily burden our, our customers and all our other stakeholders. And uh, at the same time, we are looking at the issue of equipment, which is a sore point. How then do we ensure that we improve our asset utilization? Uh, how do we ensure that we improve performance in such a manner that we're able to cater and provide for, for uh, a capital investment and, and ensure that we deliver those uh, equipment on time and we avoid what has brought us amongst others to where we are now. Uh, one of those is the deferment of investment because you always pay the price and that's where we are. Uh, we previously had made some deferment on some of the equipment acquisition. And now you, you find yourself in a situation that some of your equipment uh, uh, have passed its, 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 its uh, best performance uh, period. And we've got high uh, 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 unreliability and unavailability. And we are trying to run and expect to make certain moves. But you look at the, 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 the performance of those equipment and the lifespan of those equipment, realize that somehow, somewhere along the way, we should not have made those decisions, but unfortunately we are where we are. Our so and, uh, uh, task is to come up with a solution rather than looking backward. When it comes to, to efficiency, the areas that we're looking at is effective planning, it's equipment reliability, asset utilization, both people and equipment, uh, capacity utilization, uh, customer satisfaction and financial sustainability. But I will touch on the first uh, uh, four or five, which is the effective planning. We, we recently concluded uh, uh, a study with uh, the World Bank uh, 
assisting amongst others to pinpoint some of the pain points. And indeed, the, the issue of planning is an area that we're attending to it. Uh, that uh, I'm, I'm sure in some of the presentation, the colleagues will allude to that at a, at a regional level, improving uh, and, and ensuring that we streamline national and terminal planning to such a way that it's, it's, it, it performs better and it's, it's, it's synchronized and it gives us the, the, the efficiency. So what we have done, we've done an extensive work. Uh, uh, for now, what is left is just to implement this with speed. Uh, we've identified, we know what is wrong, and uh, hence some of our stakeholders are, are, are concerned because they said, rightful, so you know what needs to be done, why can't we just get on and do it? And that's what we're trying to do at this stage. Uh, to, to implement some of the stuff that we've identified as challenges. And uh, what we're trying to do is to quantify that if we improve the, the planning, uh, what then would become the efficiency gains in terms of the, the moves that we then translate uh, into the, the, the revenue, but more importantly, into the volumes that we move. Equipment reliability, again, when it comes to this one, we have to ensure that we deliver on our capital investment plan and ensure that we deliver that without any deferment as I've already indicated. But at the same time, the reliability is tied to supply chain. Uh, as as an entity uh, managed by the public sector frameworks, there are some constraints. What are you doing about it? We have started the discussion with DTIC in terms of the local content and localization as far as our OEMs are concerned, because those are the ones that need to supply us with the parts and, and the spares. And in some instances, you find that we have to follow a normal process, procurement process open to everyone, and then the price then comes in. And in some instances, you find that we are not using the OEM uh, 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 Paths which then has got an impact. But that uh, the discussions are ongoing. Uh, DTIC has done the study uh, and they've produced the report from their consultants. So we're engaging with them to finalize uh, that report so that we can then be allowed to, to, to standardize and be allowed to enter into long term uh, 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 partnership with the OEM such that they will then be able to service those machines, provide those parts without us necessarily having to go through the, the procurement process. Asset utilization, again, with that one, we're looking at equipment, people, what are you doing about it? We do have a technology now that uh, we're using, for instance, a Power BI for, for monitoring uh, asset uh, equipment utilization and monitoring performance, both of people uh, and also the, the, the equipment. Uh, we have those uh, uh, systems that we're using currently to assist us to be able to identify the gaps and to be able to identify the poor performance and address that uh, time at three. So capacity utilization uh, internal, we have looked at how then do we achieve uh, uh, install capacity? And then the next step will then be, how then do we go to the next step Having uh, achieved the 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 the, the capacity uh, uh, installed capacity, how then do we move to the theoretical capacity that uh, the port authority uh, uh, has for a particular uh, uh, terminal? And you will see when we touch base on this, for instance, uh, PE auto. We're looking at how then do we increase capacity there because we've reached the capacity. Uh, do, how do we then? engage with the port authority to ensure that we, 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 we increase capacity in that regard. Where there is underutilization of capacity, what then do we put in place in order to ensure that we close that gap? Uh, so when it comes to, to, to performance management, I've touched on the uh, uh, Power BI. We have a, a live dashboard, which indicate particularly in the uh, container space, which indicate uh, it's delayed by an hour or so, which indicate the performance, uh, both of the equipment and the people, and then we're able to monitor that. 
We are looking at different equipment maintenance methodologies, again, engaging with the OEMs, but in particular, we are hopeful that both the TGIC together with the National Treasury will be then amenable to what we're going to put on, on, on the table to propose to them in terms of the, uh, of the long-term plans that we would want to enter with the OEMs. Uh, vessel performance, looking at that as a vessel per transaction uh, from continuous improvement, we have done the, some baseline on the, on, the, on, the, on the bulk space in, 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 in uh, uh, Richards Bay. The issue now is to also, have, we've done some baseline for, for, for container. The issue now is start to improve uh, on the baseline that we have and, and address specific areas where we are really uh, challenged. Uh, issues of people and culture. Indeed, we also have to address the issue of uh, people uh, 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 management, uh, both at the supervisor level, the roles and the responsibility. And, but at the same time, taking into consideration that we're operating in a space that is a, 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 a highly unionized, and we need to also attend to, to and, and meet the requirements from the, the, the labor formations. So it's an issue of us, an ongoing discussion with them in order to ensure that we achieve our goals. Uh, I've already touched on the technical and SCM intervention, both the short term. So the short term, what are we doing? Whilst we're engaging with National Treasury, the plans for space and acquisition, the short term plans that in the next uh, 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 six months or so, we'll be able to have a three-year plan. And that three-year plan will give us cushion as much as our plan for long-term plan is to ensure that within the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we've gone out on the issues of the uh, standardization and the uh, uh, appointment of the OEMs. We know that with the public uh, 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 sector processes can take time. So we're putting in place a contract for space in the next three years whilst we're focusing also, I mean, whilst we're implementing the, the long-term. As soon as the long term, the medium and the long term plan is approved by relevant government authority, then we're able to, to implement that. But in the short term, we need those space, we need those contracts in place. We're also looking at the issue of a, a business maturity assessment across our different op a, a, a functional areas, your supply chain, operation, and maintenance. And uh, just to add in terms of, 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 of the, the issue of technology, adoption. We are looking at uh, the issue of uh, uh, semi-automation. Some of, some of our equipment is still very early uh, stages, but we are looking, in, particularly in the container space, we are looking at uh, uh, Cape Town Container Terminal, we are looking at DCT uh, uh, Pier 1 uh, to see uh, uh, what will be feasible but we are moving with the speed that is required. But again, uh, depending on the, the uh, issues of uh, our uh, public uh, sector frameworks, we need to uh, adhere to those. But that's the plan that we need to do when it comes to that one. For Cape Town, uh, the Port Authority has already acquired the first batch of uh, hydraulic tension for the mooring system to try to stabilize the vessels. From the port terminal authority, I mean, from the port terminal operator, what we'll then look for is the automation of our equipment uh, so that we can then be able to, to, to complement what the port authority has done and address the issue of the weather. You will see when Cape Town come to present the impact of weather on Cape Town and the volumes that we then lose and the revenue that we then lose and the inconvenience and the, the, the cost to the customers that they then experience. So financial, I won't touch a lot on this one, but the bottom line is that we want each terminal to be run as a business on its own, profitable, and not depend on any other terminal and create value to its uh, 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 customers and other stakeholders. We're looking at, at, at uh, uh, issues of minimizing cost. We're looking at uh, uh, optimizing asset utilization and we'll apply this at a terminal level at a very granular level. So the growth drivers, what are we doing? Nonto talked about the DCT. 
the partnership uh, where we are RFQ, she touched on that NCT. Richards being beginning of financial year, current financial year that we're on. We did uh, have the operational turnaround, uh, but then whatever plans that we had were then put in, in uh, uh, I mean, it was just delayed by the fires that we experienced. And we've got a, a fire recovery plan that is in place. There are still some challenges that we're dealing with. The, the, the terminal will address that, but there is some slow progress. We've got a CI team that has been sent there to assist in terms of the backlog that we have. We acknowledge that. But we're also looking at how best can we ensure that we improve in terms of the chrome and magnetite and, 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 and uh, what best can we do? We are looking at uh, issues. Uh, we're just completing the preparatory work in terms of the potential uh, opportunities that are there in terms of the capital that is required to be invested. As non as indicated, we do have challenges in terms of the, 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 the capital that is required to, to, to assist us to deliver on some of the uh, uh, equipment and some of the deliverables that are required to turn the business around. The Nuha Manganese Export Terminal is the 60 million terminal facility. There's a process ongoing there to come up with a solution uh, for Nuha and uh, that terminal uh, uh, we will share as time goes on and when we move to different steps of those uh, process. We are looking, I've already indicated the PE auto uh, 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 facility expansion. We are looking at the point container terminal as a result of the uh, port of Deben master plan. As they indicated, uh, the port of the port authority indicated they want to create a container hub. We are looking at expanding the, the container volumes in that. As you can see, that it's, a, it's a, an a MPT. It has got both a brick bulk and container. But for us now is to say, how then do we expand the, the container? Uh, Saldana, back of port, we were exploring uh, the due diligence is done there, the back of port. Uh, MPT, we're also exploring, the, uh, creating the, the agri hub. Uh, so these are some of the stuff that Nondra has touched on from TPT particular on what we're looking at. But when it comes to uh, I'm a, this is my last slide. What are the key focus initiatives that the colleagues will be uh, discussing when their presentation comes, particularly from a terminal level? We're looking at, at prioritizing the, the higher margin that are linked to, as indicated in the first slide, that are linked to uh, key sectors of the economy. We're looking at uh, improving asset management, which is the biggest challenge we're sitting with now. You look at our reliability and, and availability is very low. We're looking at uh, uh, issues of security to manage that and use of digital uh, 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 solutions to, to manage and assist us uh, with that one. We're looking at how do we optimize a turnaround, uh, the delays, uh, the congestions. Uh, are looking at uh, uh, fleet renewal, I've indicated the issue that we have done before, uh, amongst others that resulted in where we are, the deferment. And we're looking at supply chain management for those exemptions and those special regime, if we can be afforded by both the DTIC and as well as the National Treasury, that will be able to make us uh, more agile and nimble and be able to respond appropriately when we have any potential breakdowns and challenges. And some of the stuff that we're looking at the OEMs is to enter into a long-term contract in such a manner that we don't even have to have a challenges of a lot of breakdowns, but the OEM then will replace those, not parts, but also replace those machines when it's time that are due, just like anyone who's got a car, which is uh, which has got a maintenance plan, but there are times in which you then need to change the fleet. Whenever there are changes into their fleet and technology into the equipment, we want to enter into, co into contract that will then allow us for them to change and replace those uh, fleet. We're looking at the issue of uh, employee, employee morale enhancement. The board has just approved the employee incentive scheme, not only for container, but bulk, and all other employees that are at a bargaining unit within TPT. And we're hopeful that that will improve 
uh, the, 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 the morale of the employees because they've been raising the issue of the, the, uh, 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 the incentives. That has been a challenge for quite some time now. The issue of filling the vacancies while monitoring those uh, uh, very close. Indeed, there's an issue of a voluntary severance package that has been offered. Uh, then we have uh, engaged with the labor and we are accelerating the filling of the position. And I um, think the, 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 the terminal managers, I mean, the terminal colleagues will touch on that in their respective uh, presentation. The issue of safety, health, and environment, a big concern, the fires that have been happening, and also the safety, some of the incidents that are there. Because colleagues, you must also understand that when you've got this equipment, they, they also pose a challenge because we're overusing some of this. Then the risk challenge and the safety issue then becomes an issue. But we, we, we have a, a, a plans and the colleagues can touch on that when they are doing their own presentation. Proactively respond to, to customers with different forums. And we have had the colleagues and the industry indicating that some of them are not enough. We will look at that. But the bottom line is not to have too many forums, but is to come to those forums, present, and be able to deliver on what needs to, to be delivered and be accountable on whatever that we come and promise you there. As we're promising you here what we're working on, our, our plan is that from time to time we'll be able to come here and also share the, 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 the progress that we're doing. And I think uh, from, our, from my side, I think I'll stop at that. Like I indicated high level, the specifics that we would want, we'll then be able to get those uh, when the uh, uh, colleagues from the terminals and the regions are presenting. Thank you very much, uh, Harry. Harry? Tafuna, thank you very much. Um, sorry, I was disengaged with something else here. Uh, thank you for a well-structured uh, presentation. We really appreciate that. And uh, we are looking forward to engaging you with in, in the panel discussion. Ladies and gents, let's move to our next uh, presenter for today. And that's Dr. Tandu Mugabani. She's the Executive Manager of Occupational Health Transnet Group. She's going to talk about COVID-19 progressive update, the impact and management at terminals. Thank you very much, Tandu. Can you, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, Harry. Are you able to see, are you able to yes. see the screen? Yes, we see that, thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we all, about two years ago, or yeah, just over two years ago, we entered into a state of shock um, when we realized that we had a pandemic on our hand and um, we were then required to respond quite quickly. So after the initial shock in terms of the Transnet port terminals, we were aware that we were in for a long road um, and we prepared ourselves for about 18 uh, to 24 months of significant COVID-19 activity where we were expecting periodic hotspots across the diverse geographies um, of our country, as well as the areas with which we work. So um, we were prepared and also saw that the peaks and the valleys in terms of the potential models um, that we had anticipated then came with um, uh, waves that were approximately three months apart. And we also did see that in our country, those waves were really dependent on multiple factors, but primarily on the variant of concern that was uh, prevalent at the time. So in terms of then uh, Transnet port terminals um, uh, approach or response, what we did do um, what we did do and continue to do is that we keep a focus 
through various structures that we have um, uh, in within the uh, organization that is led by the command center, what we call the COVID-19 command center, which is sponsored by the chief of people management. And this is a structure that provides cross-functional enablement support to be able to deal with the four work streams that have focused on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the workplace. So we've looked at the ways of work. How do we work so that we ensure business continuity? We've also a focus area has been on the compliance stream where we are engaged in terms of complying to the legislative requirements of managing the pandemic. And our recent most um, uh, dedicated focus is really on the vaccination rollout primarily because we are aware that we have to live with the residual, um, with the residual effects of infections of COVID-19. Uh, and at this point, what we have, the best that we have at this point is for us then to vaccinate so that we can return to some level of um, normalcy. We also were focused on dealing with the crisis. However, post the 24 month um, uh, period, we are now at a stage where we are no longer looking at COVID-19 as a crisis. However, we are looking at COVID-19 as an area which is institutionalized into how we respond to um, health and safety issues within the workplace. So in line with that then, what we, we then focused on was the COVID-19 lines of defenses, which were primarily five lines of defenses developed along the Swiss cheese approach, where any of the layered lines of defenses were then meant to ensure that we try and minimize whatever residual risk that was not dealt with by the prior uh, line of defense. So our first line was really uh, looking at the area around prevention in the context that a pandemic, the, in a pandemic, the employees are, or, are also community citizens. And our main focus there was on the issue of the behavior change. On the second line of defense, we looked at uh, controls in the workplace and focused really in terms of screening, uh, uh, screening employees for um, uh, signs and symptoms and also testing for COVID-19. We must say that in the earlier, um, in the earlier uh, times of COVID-19, the screening did really help us to um, be able to identify employees that were coming into the workplace and with a possible infection. The third line of defense really was what we have now institutionalized uh, in terms of the guidelines and protocols and ensured that, that those form part of the day-to-day -day, uh, core functions in the relevant uh, department. And then the top part with really in terms of what assisted us, we will show this um, in terms of a, a, a slide that will come later on, but the issue around case analytics did help us to ensure that we identify our weaknesses, we are able to target our intervention and our response in areas that uh, helps us to minimize uh, business disruptions. And since the first line of defense then was then to concentrate on areas that would allow us to return back to work in a an almost near, near normal capacity. And we have been doing this since October 2020. Um, and uh, last year, October, we then had full on return um, uh, to the work site in terms of the um, uh, 
uh, uh, transnet uh, employees. However, operations, in terms of operations, that return to normal, uh, return to full capacity was really instituted around uh, June, between June and September uh, 2020. Now, uh, when it comes to then the focus, as I said before, we have four work streams, which really focus on ensuring that um, the workplace uh, disruptions are minimized as far as uh, COVID is concerned. We have the compliance officer stream, which then takes looks at the risk adjusted level directives and guidelines uh, to ensure that we are uh, complying. The stream then oversees the implementation of the COVID-19 workplace plan. It also oversees the adherence to health and hygiene protocols in relation to COVID-19 in the workplace and provides reports to the organization, uh, the GCE, the Department of Public Enterprises, the Department of Health and uh, NIC. So we'll be talking a lot. I'm going to pass the slides, but we I'm going to focus a lot in terms of our work in relation to the vaccination rollout and what current thoughts are when it comes to COVID-19 vaccination. But the work stream really has been focusing on ensuring access. We've got we have 15 uh, vaccination sites that are currently ensuring that vaccines are uh, accessible to employees at the workplace. These consist of the uh, transnet clinics, as well as the uh, pop-up sites where we do not have six clinics. So why are we focusing on vaccination? And the point around um, uh, focusing around vaccination is really um, uh, based on multiple issues which are outlined here in the slide, but the key focus even uh, of these uh, uh, six issues is to ensure that we have employees whose health is not compromised, or at least that wherever we cannot improve, that we maintain the same level of health um, uh, that they had prior to uh, getting infected with COVID-19. And we know that the advantage of the vaccine is currently really in its ability to minimize severe disease as well as fatality. The next component of, the, of, the, of why we are fo focusing so much on the vaccination is because we are aware that this then contribute to organizational resilience. But the recognition is also that people who are working as operations um, and anyway in transnet sites are a valued asset that ensures business continuity. Now, the, we have been um, working through the Department of Employment and Labor Directives in terms of mandatory vaccination within the workplace. And some of the considerations that we have looked at in terms of the risk assessment is the environment which we are in, the job task does not allow for physical distancing. Uh, it is transmitted for terminals in congregate setting where there is high human traffic and people also work indoors. Um, uh, and one recognition which we have had is that the remote working in some of the job categories is unsustainable and has led to um, some uh, challenges in terms of our turnaround time uh, in, in, in the responses that we give. So, so uh, even people who are working in, in support services, therefore, are very critical in ensuring that they do return to the work site and indoor spaces, which we, as now we do know that indoor, indoor workspaces 
have a higher propensity for uh, COVID-19 transmission than outdoors. And then we also have the situation where the end of the national state of disaster is being discussed. And the reason why the discussion is on the table is the recognition that vaccines are our uh, hope to be able to return to a level of normal functioning. In the environment of COVID-19, uh, yes, we had looked at about 24 months during the pandemic. However, we are critically aware that the area around COVID is very uncertain. And we are now also looking at the fifth wave, which we are anticipating. The other issue that makes us concentrate on the vaccination is that we have a substantial proportion of our workforce that is vulnerable to severe disease, which we do want to protect. Another element is the risk that we face and also the legal uh, considerations that the employer, which is Transnet in this instance, is responsible to ensure a safe working environment and also to implement reasonable interventions of which we see COVID-19 vaccination as one. We have a supply of uh, vaccines that are safe, have been proven to be of good quality and effective against uh, COVID, essentially, as we said, against severe disease and, um, um, and fatalities. We do know that um, infection people with uh, who have vaccinated can get breakthrough infection. However, we are leveraging on the advantage of its uh, importance on severe disease and fatality minimization. Our other challenge though, is that we do have a low vaccination uptake among employees. So that is why we are really focusing on the issue of uh, vaccination at this point with the foresight that we want to be able to ensure that there's increased employee fatality and also minimization on disruptions in terms of um, business continuity. Now, when we look at the uh, where we currently are since the pandemic be uh, began in Transnet, we have experienced approximately 2,000 um, a notification of positive cases within our environment across the port um, in the three provinces, in the three provinces, the coastal, and also the inland port in the uh, other two provinces. So the total deaths have been 45 um, that are reported as COVID related. However, our the recovery rate is also quite high at approximately uh, 97 percent and unfortunately our vaccination rate as I indicated is quite low at around uh, 20 percent. Now the, we have been also been able to monitor the pandemic in terms of the wave and what has been happening within TPT and we'll show a later slide on what Inform information we have gathered has been able to assist us with. And thank thankfully, in terms of the COVID-related debt, we, the last report of a COVID-related debt within our environment was in uh, uh, September last year. So within the current uh, fourth wave, we have not had a, a COVID-related um, notification of a COVID-related death. We can see from the positive cases that Cape Town, uh, the area, Cape Town terminals had the highest cases in terms of the positive cases, and that uh, essentially happened in the first wave. And then um, KwaZulu-Natal uh, 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 terminals also had a high number of uh, COVID-19 cases that were reported. But what is key in terms of our management 
is that at each point and on a daily basis, what we do do is we monitor which levels and which positions are affected by uh, the COVID-19 absence on a daily basis so that we can inform operations and they are then able to make arrangements accordingly. So, so this is where um, we, we, we were able then to leverage in terms of using our data analytics and look at uh, supporting the business to be able to assess what the impact on a day-to-day -day basis would be. And then that information also helped us to plan accordingly so that we minimize uh, any disruptions. If you look at the um, first wave, what happened in the first wave is that the number of cases were uh, 725. We can see positive cases, 725. And uh, similarly, we can see that in the first wave, workplace contacts, which means people that were infected because of interaction with other employees within the workplace was at about 196. But most importantly, when we did the analytics, we saw that unplanned absence was really being affected by uh, what we call the close context, the defined close context of people who were interacting with positive employees before they were diagnosed as being positive. And if we look at the first wave, the ratio was that for each positive employee, we had 1.2 other employees who were then identified as close contacts and then had to uh, spend 10 to 14 days at home, which did result in business disruption. However, what we did then was to utilize that information to be able to target our interventions and focus on minimizing close contact at work. So we strengthened our controls. And what we saw is that in the next waves, that paid off. And in the second wave, our ratio of positive case to um, uh, workplace close contact reduced from one positive, for every one positive employee, we then reduced that to 0.4 close contact, which means we had less people going to stay at home in quarantine uh, just because they were close contact to a positive employee. And we can see that in the fourth wave, this was uh, significantly reduced. So between the waves, this was reduced from, from 1 is to 1.2 to 1 is to 0 0.2, which meant that with, by the fourth wave, we were at least able to reduce absence of close contact, unplanned absence of close on contacts to one sixth of what it was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And this we saw as a quite a, a, a positive and uh, a successful intervention because then it reduced the number of days that employees were absent from work and therefore were unable to work during the uh, progressive ways. What were the lessons that we learned? Um, we, we learned that uh, behavior, health seeking behavior and mindset is a very key element in terms of epidemic control. And therefore, what is important and that we continue to do is constant engagement with employees as well as labor in terms of ensuring that we comply so that we maintain the low levels of um, workplace uh, infection transmission. The other area that became key was that fear and stigmatization is a reality in terms of uh, mental health. At the beginning, uh, people did stay away from work just because of the fear, even though they were not infected. 
and they were not um, and they, they were not close contact. So we uh, ensured that we improve our offerings in terms of mental health support to employees. Uh, our structures are continuous in terms of ensuring and focusing that the support from the health, health and wellness and safety areas uh, support to ensure that business continuity management is in place and this is replicated at terminal level. Uh, what COVID-19 has taught us is that it's important for us to focus on biological hazardous agents in the workplace. Uh, some of us know that currently we are also talking of typhoid. So this is not the end when we're talking about the biological hazardous agents. So it has also helped us to increase our surveillance in the workplace in terms of infectious diseases. We do know that the next pandemic is in the horizon. We don't know when, but what is important is that as we uh, have that in mind, we have a swift response. And thankfully we have now through the COVID-19 situation have been able to build partnerships with the various government departments, as well as the customers um, and, 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 and uh, people whom we service. So we think that we are better prepared uh, for the next pandemic that is in the, in the horizon for us then to be able to respond swiftly. But I think what is key in terms of the lesson that we have learned and our focus in uh, increasing the depth of our health and wellness program is that really, uh, it might sound like a cliche, but health is our best wealth as human beings. And so our focus within TPT has really to increase the depth of our health and wellness programs to ensure that where we can, employees' health is improved through a partnership of ensuring that individuals themselves um, uh, develop or, or um, look at health-seeking behaviors um, and, and also ensuring, through us ensuring that if in, a, in the instance where we are unable then to improve the health, at least we should be able to maintain the health levels and it is not worsened uh, by uh, people being in the workplace. So that's it from me. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Ngobane, thank you so much. And it's, it's uh, encouraging to see the good work you guys are doing and uh, encouraging to see that the COVID-19 positive rate is coming down and uh, keeping up the good health and transnet. Uh, so important. Thank you so much for this presentation. We really appreciate that. Ladies and gents, um, Right, we, we're going to, to um, do a short lunch break now, a half an hour uh, lunch break. And um, just putting up our program here. And then uh, after the lunch break, we're going to listen to the four um, terminal operations plans. And uh, we had a, a small shift in the program. This is going to present first, then Dawn, then Keith, and then O. Um, so 12.30, and I kindly see all of you back, and we have a listen. And then after the, the four thermal presentations, then we will have a, a, a questions and answer session. So thank you very much. We see you then at 12.30. Thank you so much.
Okay, colleagues, let's take up our seats so that we can continue with the session this afternoon. Right, we had an exciting session this morning, and uh, we're still being hosted by Transnet for Terminals. And the theme for our event is reinvigorating for competitive and competitiveness and future growth. And it's the 22nd of February, 2022. And uh, yeah, so from now on, we're going to listen to operational plans from all terminals, so Saldana terminals, Durban terminals, Cape terminals, and Richard Bay terminals. They after we will have a, a question session. Now, um, we had a slight change in the program. We're going to first have Mr. Viss uh, Loganathan to present. He's the National Planning Manager of Durban terminals, and he's going to talk about Durban terminal terminals uh, operation plans. Thank you very much, Viss. Thank you very much, um, Harry. I, I just want to check uh, I am nice and audible on your end, sir. We can hear you, yes. Great. Um, so, a uh, very good afternoon to the valued stakeholders, uh, our guests, and, and also the Transnet colleagues online. I will be taking you through uh, the Durban Terminals uh, uh, plans. Um, Harry, I'm just trying to share the presentation quickly. Harry, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I see there's a slight delay on, on my side in terms of the sharing. Just give me a second. No problem. Okay, Harry, uh, in the interest of time, uh, while it's trying to obviously uh, project uh, is it okay if I continue uh, I see my screen is freezing just give me a second hand sure coming through now okay yeah, it's very slow on my side, Harry. Uh, just give me a second. Harry, I'm putting it on slideshow, so just let me know once you get to that state. You should be seeing it on your side. You can okay, continue. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, folks, uh, first up is a, a satellite view of the Port of Durban. Uh, we are indeed extremely blessed to have a multi-commodity facility here on the East Coast. Uh, we have, we have um, a container terminal facility uh, between Pier 1 and Pier 2. We have multi-purpose facilities at our point terminal automotive uh, adjoining the multi-purpose terminals, and then we have the Maiden Wharf terminal. So we have a full spectrum of commodity sectors in uh, this uh, terminal, in this region. I think the only equivalent would be PE, but obviously on a much, much smaller scale. So, so indeed, uh, it is a hub that we want to develop and, and take forward. If I look at some numbers, uh, P, our Pier 1 terminal has an annual throughput of 700,000, Pier 2, 2 million, Durban car terminal 520. And when I go through the actual uh, uh, numbers for each of the individual terminals, you will realize we are actually fully utilizing these facilities, which means that our plans going forward needs to be quite agile to extract more value from them in terms of capacity. So a lot of our energy is being spent on pushing up the capacity ability of these terminals. If I look at the point terminal, we have a multi-purpose capability handling 
227,000 TUs and about 200,000 brake bulk. And then the Maiden Wharf Terminal, which is our signature bulk facility, has a 2 million uh, ton capability. In terms of what are we focusing on, what keeps us up day and night in terms of operational performance and actions, there's three key pillars, which is process, equipment and people. And these three in synchronicity is going to give us the leverage in terms of productivity improvement. So if I focus on the Durban terminals, what are the key turnaround initiatives? Straight off the bat on, on point number one is, is the optimizations of gangs. So why is gangs such a critical factor? It's our ability to turn around the vessels. Um, and we want to have six gangs. Currently we have five, we have uh, 12 at Pier 2, we wanna to go to 14. Now, what has happened over the last five years is that the number of volumes per vessel per capita has increased significantly. So if you look at a facility like Pier 2, in 1718, we were handling around 4,300 moves per vessel. Now, in the current fin financial year, we're handling about 5,700. To be able to turn around those vessels, you need a minimum crane density of three. Hence, the ability to have 14 gangs uh, at the beck and call of the operational planning team is important. It will help us to meet the changing ecosystem. Secondly, what is changing in the ecosystem is we're seeing an increase in terms of the number of 40-foot containers that are coming in. And I think somebody in the earlier discussion spoke about so there's a general shipping trend of more 40 foots. They are obviously more economical. You can take more product in them, um, especially if goods are very light. So they ease those changes, which means that our stacking areas and the management thereof becomes very critically. So there's gang augmentation at Pier 1, Pier 2. In terms of people, those are the key uh, actions. Also allied to people, and it was spoken about earlier on, is our incentive scheme, which has been approved and in the process of being executed. That will obviously enhance uh, people motivation and an ability to reward performance for the teams on the ground. In terms of equipment, um, equipment plays a critical role in providing backup support to the gangs. So we have the human capital, but the equipment provides the mobility, in particular, our straddle carriers. And those are the prime movers at Pier 2 in terms of equipment. They provide the land side and water side backup equipment. We've operationalized in the last financial year, 45 new straddles. We're in the process of procuring another 33. So there's lots of infusion of equipment, that equipment will translate into more moves per capita behind each crane. We also have acquired two additional RTGs at Pier 1 and in a process of bringing in 16. Pier 1 started in 2007, so obviously the age requires replacement and hence the quite significant replacement program uh, which is scheduled to start in around 2023. We're also working very closely with OEMs that are supply the equipment to ensure midlife refurbishments and the like is, is on track and on a par. Uh, those are the key uh, headline actions that we are focusing on. Uh, before I move off the slide, just also just to cover the planning, I think the planning was also mentioned quite significantly earlier on. We are working uh, closely with our partners in the Navis field to optimize our planning capability, particularly in terms of the advanced tools. So we have a very sophisticated planning system called Navis, and we, we are busy working on using the full set of menus and capabilities that are within that system. And obviously upgrading and upskilling our planners to make use of that is critical. Just to give you an example, what I'm meaning in effect, we have a straddle carrier picking up a container of a truck, taking it to stack. We want to develop a dual cycle where the straddle carrier comes back from the stack with the container. So it's about optimizing and removing waste from the system 
getting full value from the asset. So more is not necessarily the solu solution in itself, but it needs to be augmented with optimize. And planning is a key ability, provides a key ability to take full use of that optimization. If I move on to the next slide, which is actually covering peer two. Now, peer two year to date is averaging about 45.5. And I spoke about how gangs and administering gangs over a vessel can increase productivity. Allied to the productivity is the stack. And one of the key enablers of performance in a container terminal, and this will apply both to peer one, peer two, is stack fluidity. It's the rate at which we keep boxes moving out of the terminal, either into the ecosystem if it's imports or onto vessels if it's exports. Without stack fluidity, we'll not be able to maintain. So we can put lots of new equipment, we can put the gangs, we can have motivated people and staff, but if there is not the wherewithal in terms of stack and fluidity, we're going to have a very congested space to be able to deliver the norms required. Now, I want to draw your attention if you look at the ship working hour towards the middle of the year, around August, September, that was the period in the aftermath of the cyber attack and the civil unrest in uh, KZN. And what we saw is something quite, quite remarkable when it comes to uh, the different stakeholders coming together. We were in the midst of, and I remember this so vividly, we, in a, we were in the midst of a peak reefer season. We had the severe disruptions, the supply chain was totally congested. We came together as a supply chain and we were able to recover quickly. I think this is the power of possibility, the power of coming together. I think Lufuno mentioned in his opening statement about walking together. When we walk together, so much more is possible. And what was the outcome of that resilience? You know, and if you ask us, okay, you're saying it, but you know, tangibly, can you demonstrate it? In 2021, Durban shipped a record 87 million cartons equivalent of fruit, of citrus fruit, highest on record, notwithstanding the disruptions that we had in the month of July and obviously the recovery periods of August and September. So integration is going to be a critical and collaborative critical aspects of supply chain development. And I'll talk a lot about that as part of our future endeavors. Truck turnaround time, we need to work on, and we are working on a program to make sure that we reduced wasteful uh, rehandling in our stacks. So on average, we handle about 3,000 containers in our uh, Durban Container Terminal, Pier 2, half of it is imports, and 30% of that is actually wasted moves. So container is being picked up and rehandled because the customer that needs the box is at the bottom of the pile. So what we want to move towards, and we'll talk about it under mass evacuation, is sequential collection. That will immediately increase productive moves on the land side by up to 30%. Obviously, it will happen in phases. We will not be able to mass evacuate, but we're looking at some very robust targets and the team are busy working on the business rules to support mass evacuation. So key response plans I, I alluded to is the infusion of equipment. We spoke about the incentive schemes to uh, imbue uh, motivation and participation and engagement. And then from a process perspective is decongesting. And this, this very much applies to both container terminals at uh, Pier 2 and Pier 1. We are seeing very good traction at our Pier 1 facilities. I looked at the numbers just before getting to this uh, call. We are on track to deliver numbers that we saw pre-COVID in terms of volume. So we're very much on track to deliver these numbers, but it requires 
incredible sustenance to keep stacks fluid. And I think that's where the big focus for our container terminals. What it will mean that as we develop these mass evacuations, we need to have commensurate back of port facilities to support the mass evacuation in our containment terminals. And there is a slide that talks to that uh, coming up shortly. If I go to our point terminal, our point terminal offers a bouquet of services covering brake bulk and containers. The container element is important, particularly during our peak seasons. What we find is as the vessel calls increase to take and export the fruit out of Durban, there are calls that are diverted to, to uh, the uh, Durban Roro terminal point and equipment. We're focusing a lot on the equipment, particularly our mobile cranes. Those are the key instruments for offloading and loading and working with our OEMs, we have improved the maintenance uh, regime on these mobile harbor cranes. We're also working on managing the high operator turnover uh, as we recruit and increase our human capital on the container terminals. There are uh, people that apply and get promoted. And then obviously it creates gaps on the MPTs. We are closing those gaps through fixed term contractors. And then obviously in terms of process, we're looking at the master plan that TNPA uh, uh, announced about creating the Durban hub. And obviously MPT is very much a pivot and a focal point of that. So the MPTs are a critical leverage, particularly during our peak season to mitigate congestion. If I move to Durban Roro, uh, Durban Roro terminal in terms of uh, the performance metrics has been on par and, and above. One thing though that had, has been uh, a challenge has been the high stack congestion. Now, what is very interesting with the Durban Roro, similar to the phenomenon I spoke about at the container terminals, vessels are getting bigger. So in this current financial year, the team has regularly handled vessels discharging in excess of 5,000 units, which means Vis, I think you muted yourself. That's not the show what happened there. Um, kind of unmute. Okay, Ari, I think I'm unmuted, so I'm going to reshare again. Apologies for that. I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, I'm not too sure what happened. Apologies. Yeah. Ari, will you let me know if I'm back on? If you're back on, you can just go slideshow mode. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I, I was at Rora, apologies for that, folks. So I was at Rora Terminal, and what I was saying is the phenomenon of these big vessels, it means there's a infusion of massive amount of units in a very short space of time. So within 24 to 48 hours, you're getting three to 4,000 imports being put on the ground, and the team has been working incredibly with the supply chain stakeholders to remove these units over a 24-hour period. And what, I, what that has done is enable the team very successfully. I, I must say, we're on track now to do over 500,000 units in Durban Car Terminal. And the only way we are able to do that is by working in a synchronous way with our supply chain partners to remove these cars over a 24-hour period. So collaboration and working intensively 
to create better visibility of the supply chain, better coordination and better execution is key. Um, on our own, there's, there's a limited amount we can do to optimize the capacity. So basically, we have now gone back. We've had a obviously a terrible 20, uh, 2021 due to COVID, but now in terms of the volumes we're projecting to end this financial year, which ends in about a month's time, we will go back to pre-COVID uh, levels, which is obviously very positive, and it gives us obviously great momentum going into the new financial year for the automotive sector. I will speak about uh, the plans for the automotive in terms of back of port, which is a critical enabler to sustain these good progress uh, performances we've seen uh, year to date. If I go to our maiden wharf and agri bulk, uh, our agri bulk uh, has a 2 million capability and it has been augmented with uh, a major commissioning of two brand new import offloaders. Uh, we call them vegans in, in, in operational parlance. So we have commissioning engineers on site that are busy putting the nuts and bolts and finalizing the commission. Uh, we anticipate commissioning those units in hot commissioning on a vessel by the 7th of March. So that gives us the wherewithal to bring in agricultural products on the import side, very important as a conduit for the economy and particularly to better utilize Durban's capability. Up to this point, the focus has been predominantly on exports. On the export side, we are anticipating uh, a very, very uh, robust uh, May season starting in April, and we are expecting uh, a full schedule for, for, for that period. One of the major constraints on the, um, MP, uh, on the agri bulk side has been the ability to optimize tonnages, and that's due to the, to the draft. What we are doing with our engineering team and project team is to install fenders that will allow us to optimize the draft and that would enable more tonnage. So if, if, if we can't get more tonnage, it means that exporters have to use multiple facilities to top up and that brings in additional costs. So I think having the fenders install will augment uh, draft, which will enable more tonnage through the uh, bulk, uh, our bulk plant at, at uh, Maiden Wharf. Um, just in terms of some of the key response actions, we're focusing on UPS and generators, which uh, impacted our wave bridges that is up and running. And obviously we're working on a, on a very uh, aggressive new maintenance regime, particularly in the aftermath of the fire incident we had in our bulk facility. Einstein famously said, if we just do the same things over and over, uh, expecting different results is insanity. And uh, it's a realization that has now fueled uh, a key signature project and initiative for the new financial year, which we are busy working with in terms of business rules. One of the key factors that constrains our ability to move product is the congestion. And the congestion is driven by sporadic collection. A customer comes to pick up a specific container. That container is at the bottom of the pile. We shift to containers. As I said, it adds 30%. So we are busy finalizing business rules that will allow mass evacuation on a sequential basis. Mass evacuation on a sequential basis, so there'll be no shuffling. So straight away, we put 30% back more moves into the operational capability. So for every 100 units, we can do additional 30 if we mass evacuate on a sequential basis. Sequentially mass evacuating tied up to obviously a back of port. Mass evacuation is the umbilical cord between the port terminal and the back of port. It means over a shortened period, off peak periods, we are targeting at the moment night shifts, we'll be able to move hundreds of containers into a backup port. Now, why is that significant? As soon as we sequentially remove these containers, those ground slots in our stacking space is immediately recyclable. We can then re reutilize that for either imports coming off other vessels. We can use it for building export stacks of forthcoming vessels. So there is huge benefit 
that can be accrued to the ecosystem. It means that vessels are able to adhere. Now, if you look at the fourth point on what we have in front of us is CETO compliance adherence. That's basically a schedule. For vessels to adhere to schedule, it needs fluid stacks. Without fluid stacks, we are going to be challenged to turn around that vessel, which then detracts from service reliability. Cargo owners have been severely challenged in the last two years due to the on effects of COVID, the disruptions to supply chain. So market connectivity is critical. Back of port also plays a key role in mitigating the challenges we had on our rail system. We, uh, we, you, you must be aware of the disruptions to our rail system through cable theft. And what the team has done has, has built a dealing strategy, which basically means we get units coming from the inland terminals, we put it into a facility that adjoins the terminal uh, and stack those export units. And then when stack opens, we move it in. Again, back of port playing a key role in ensuring effectiveness of the supply chain. There's two ways we can mass evacuate. We can either do it by road or rail. Both provides ample opportunity to, to move product, product in a very short space of time. Last year, towards the end of November, I think it was early December, we did two very successful trials between Pier 2 and the Bayhead Terminal, which is about 7.7 .7 kilometers away. Over 100 TUs on those two trials were mass evacuated. At the Bayhead Terminal, those units had on average a turnaround time of 15 minutes. Mass evacuating and quick collection. It moves away the need to get onto Bayhead Road to collect in the uh, congestion that is very prevalent over peak periods on Bayhead Road. So we want to remove congestion, move the product to the back of port, and then at a far faster turnaround time, remove containers to the end user. In terms of car terminal, um, we want to do a similar, we have started a similar pilot that we ran uh, between uh, Cato Ridge, Amlas Road and the port to demonstrate the benefit. We were able to move a few thousand units to the back of port and then obviously bring them into the terminal at a closer, at a, at a, at a closer time to vessel arrival. Sorry, Che, uh, there's some noise in the background. I'm not sure. Yes. Hi, Che, can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I muted that person. Okay, sorry about that. So, uh, Che, as I was saying, the, the, the car terminal is also uh, a key part of our back of port development. Last year, we undertook a pilot study, which we ran for six weeks. Again, aptly and, and coherently demonstrating the benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I go to the next slide, is actually an example thereof, where we have an OEM producing 14 days in advance, product moves to a back of port, 60 to 70 kilometers from the port. So between days 14 and day seven, cars are stored there by vessel and POD. And then from day seven to six, uh, seven to zero, before vessel arrivals, we move them to the port. We have two means of moving them. We can use car carriers, and obviously rail provides the ability to mass move units over a short space of time. Bottom line is the terminal remains fluid. It is then able, we are able then to have the ability to breach that 520,000 TU current capacity. It enable us to go up to 550,000 in the car terminal. So these are the signature um, initiatives that the urban terminals will be focusing on share over uh, the, the next couple of months. And uh, we will be engaging intensively with our supply chain stakeholders. I know the team is busy finalizing business rules. We will share with the marketplace in the next week. I was part of those some discussions yesterday and we're very close to releasing those business rules. Uh, where we will enlist support, collaboration from our supply chain stakeholders. Uh, Chair, uh, let me uh, pause there and, and bring my presentation for now to a close and, and hand back to you, sir. Thank you so much. This was extremely interesting.
and encouraging to see the work you guys are doing. I'm quite sure that people would like to engage with you just now in the, in the questions and answer session. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. We really appreciate that. Ladies and gents, our next uh, terminal operations discussion is from Cape Terminals. And that is Ms. Dawn Seister. She's planning manager Cape Terminals. So she's going to talk about their operation plans. Thank you very much, uh, Dawn. Good afternoon, Harry, our valued stakeholders and colleagues. Um, I'll share my screen now, Harry. Um, yes, please. Two seconds. Thank you. Can't seem to find it. Can you see that, Harry? Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Dawn Seiston, as I said, good afternoon, everybody. I'll focus on uh, the contain and the auto sector for the Cape Corridor, which runs from East London through to Cape Town. So what I thought I'd do was give you the state of our operation, where we measure the vessels, uh, Lufuno made my reference to where we measure each vessel as a transaction. So we measure from the arrival at outer breakwater up until the vessel departs. And that includes our birthing delays. So what I done was I thought I'd show you the difference where we are currently where in our financial year, which runs from April up until March the following year. So these are measured 2018, 2019, April to March and such. So birthing delays, as you can see, for, for Dawn, most of uh, our apologies. Dawn, apologies. Yes. Can you just hit that uh, slide show, that slide view button again? It doesn't come through. Slide, okay. slide view. Let's see. And now, Harry? Not yet. Because it's on slide view on my side. No, no, not on our side. Something is going on. Are you working on two screens? No. Well, maybe if you go to slideshow at the top and say from start. Hi, Harry. From our side, I can see it from my side. Yeah, but can you see it in slideshow view? Let's start again. In the top of your screen, the slideshow, the one menu option, slideshow. You click there and you, and you, and you select uh, from start. Start from over. And now, Harry. Is it? Yeah, so, yeah, click on slideshow again. Let's just see. I have. Otherwise, we're wasting too much time. I think just continue as it is. We can see the slides, even though it's not on slide view. Because I've just put it on slide view again. No, no, it's not working on our side. You see, if, if at the top of your screen, there's a slideshow option under your menus at the top. Slideshow. If you click there, and you select from start or from the beginning. I don't, I think it's fine. Go on, we, we continue. With the Harry, presentation. We can see. Salim, yeah. Do you want us to present on behalf of Dawn? We'll just, we, we'll sit. Let Ash um, we can project do that, the yes. slide. We can do that. Okay. 
Don't let Ash present for okay. you. She'll drive it. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. So what I was saying was I, was I thought I'd show you the difference. As you can see from a birthing delay perspective, we um, the birthing delays have gone up for the container terminals, except for Cape Town, where we are now. Currently, for, for Cape Town, they have been reduced. Uh, PECT has also been reduced by, by 50, more than 50%, as well as our car terminals. Birth occupancy for NCT has increased compared to last year, as well as for Cape Town. Actually, most of all our terminals, except this London Auto Terminal. Volumes, um, we, have a, we had a reduction in volumes. We had a reduction in volumes for, for obvious reasons. We had COVID and uh, we, had, we had COVID as well as for our auto terminals, the OEM suffered a few uh, issues. Productivity, we basically on um, for NCT, basically the same as last year at the same time. Our ship working hours increased as well as our truck turnaround time have decreased. And I'll add on that on the, the interventions that were put in place. Cape Town Container Terminal, GCH has remained the same. We have lost a couple of hours with ship working hour and I'll explain why with the next slide. And our truck turnaround time is also basically, it has improved since 2019, 2020. The PE container terminal, we, um, GCH has remained the same. Our ship working hour has been reduced and uh, due to some equipment issues that we had there. And truck turnaround time as well has increased also due to some equipment challenges that we experienced. Our auto terminals, however, is very stable when it comes to productivity, and we're very proud of that. Currently, we're moving around about 170 units per hour for both uh, auto terminals. Thanks, Ash. Next slide. What I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd explain to you the strategic context of Cape Town container terminals. If you look at the birthing delays, compared to last year, there's a 52% improvement year to date, as I say, from April 2021 up until January 22. However, we have had, we have seen an increase in our weather delays that we had there's an 11% increase in the uh, delays due to weather. In essence, we then, if you look year to date, we've lost about 67,6 days, which is again, as I showed above, 11% increase compared to last year this time. And with all that being said, we had a reduction in our birth occupancy. Next slide, please, Ash. I thought I'd like to show you, I've taken January alone this year, and on the 25th of June, we lost a complete 24 hours. And if you can see um, from the 24th of June, right up until the 31st, oh, sorry, January, up until the 31st of January, every day we had wind delays. And all of these delays, with the exception of the 25th, as I shown, the 24th, they were all at night. So every day we suffered weather delays. If it wasn't wind, it would be either fog or it would have been um, vessel movement, which comes with the excessive waves, which creates the surge of the on the vessels. And then we can't work because the vessel is moving too much. So this on its own, there was a comment made by Derek earlier in the morning about the equipment and um, weather challenges. And this is testament to what he has been querying 
earlier this morning in the chat group. Thanks, Ash. For NCT, we've had a reduction in our birthing delays, as well as uh, we've seen a 51% drop in our wind hours that we, we lost where we could not work. In essence, we lost about 39 days thus far for the year, and our birth occupancy, because the weather has reduced, or rather the weather delays have reduced, we could birth more vessels. So you'll see the increase in the birth occupancy going up by 6%. So due to all of that, what we've done was there's some uh, efficiency programs that we have running in Cape Town. So to improve the flow of containers, both waterside and landside, what we've done in collaboration with TNPA, we've installed short engineers, two short engineers to reduce the surge so that when the wind is howling in Cape Town or over the mountain, then at least we can still continue working and that there's no surge or when the waves are high, we don't have the vessels moving so we can still work those vessels. So there have been two units that have been installed and last month we have asked the shipping lines to start using them. However, there were some reservations which TNPA and ourselves were busy sorting out with the customers. And um, so, like Viz said, four pillars that we focus on, which is systems, equipment, processes, and people. From a systems perspective, we have introduced a mandatory truck appointment system um, at Cape Town container terminals. However, we do find that the system is not being utilized for the full 24 hours. So we are encouraging all our customers to utilize the night shift. And in collaboration with the shipping lines, which we have meetings with every once a week, we do find that they are starting to utilize those night shift hours. So we are moving more cargo during um, on, the, on the land side. From an equipment perspective, we have um, got the STS OEMs to assist us with crane and RTG maintenance that is currently already in place. Processes, we're trying to improve our crane deployment. Currently, we'll put um, either three cranes on each vessel or we go with a crane split of four, four or three so that we can turn those vessels around quicker so that we can birth the next vessel and work that vessel. With planning, we've got to be plan with the shipping lines, as I said, we and key industry players to improve our yard processes. So weekly we meet with, with shipping lines to collaborate with them. And we basically have like a pre-vessel uh, meeting with each shipping line so that we can see what it is that we expect, what obstacles we're going to to expect on each vessel, as well as what are we both going to put in place together so that we can overcome those obstacles. We also have meetings with the auto industry, as well as the table grapes and the deciduous groups, as well as the FMCG groups that we meet with in Cape Town, so that we can look and see what it is that we can do better on each vessel that, that's going to arrive. Um, as I said, with the, this, this uh, reduce our critical space, the lead time, and then the wind strategy that we've put in place, specifically for the reefers. We also, um, as I said, we try and we, we encourage the shipping lines to encourage their um, trucking companies to bring reefers in on the slot basis throughout the 24 hours. From a people perspective, we want to ramp up to align with the seven gangs, both ops and planning. So we've got 42 extra DAVs and we're going to be, Lufuno made mention of getting more operators. So we're currently busy with those RTG and STS operators. And external technical service providers, we've got them who are assisting specifically in Cape Town on the, the internal truck side. And then we also have technical resources and managers uh, from NCT who goes up regularly to assist Cape Town as well as from Pier 2. Thanks, um, Ash. So 
Lufuna also made mention of the World Bank. So the World Bank was at DCT Pier 2 and specifically at NCT. So they gave us about 123 different initiatives that they said we could concentrate on. And part of those were from a TPT perspective to ensure that the birth capacity exists to deal with all our vessel backlogs. What they meant was um, when we do CTOC vessels, we align it to the birth plan. So what they asked us to do was to measure how many of those vessels arrive within that pro forma birth plan. And coupled to that, they said, if, you know, what we should do is look at and have monitor these and have these discussions with customers to say, you've asked for this. Why are you not utilizing these slots? Because if they're not arriving, obviously, it's going to have a negative impact on the next uh, vessel. Or if they're increasing their cargo load, then it has a negative impact on, on the next vessel, which means they stay longer on the berth and the vessel that's due to arrive in that time, they're basically eating up into that into the next vessel's time. The planet training, we are currently busy with that. Viz has made mention of it, where we are collaborating with NAVIS to give our planners the extra training. And we're focusing at NCT, we already have primary route um, installed in our terminal operating system and at NCT what we do is we utilize that also by backloading so to visitors point where you have the the truck driver not going back to the vessel or from the vessel with that empty load so if we are on a discharge cycle of a vessel that truck will collect a container from the vessel take it to the stack but at the same time when he or she's done with that stacking that container he will collect a container from the stack and take it either to the crane that is loading or to another vessel that is loading so with that being said you reduce your 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 costs of the terminal but at the same time you are optimally utilizing your resources and then we, they also suggested or recommended that we have customer performance metrics and monitor those. We do currently have, but they've also asked, asked us to look at missed and cancelled gate transactions, look at reducing free times of to, so that we can uh, change our free times so that we can reduce dwell times. That being said, was the minute the box lands on the ground, if it's a discharge box, make it available to the customer to collect and then also to reduce our low peak pickups which are which I made reference to which is night shift as well as deliveries and then promote road to rail with that being said in Cape Town we've got Balcon and that with the FMCG groups we were utilizing it effectively from a customer perspective they asked us to look at um issues of stowage plan where what we found was that you'll have the, 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 the shipping lines, the vessel would sometimes be alongside and we are on the discharge cycle and the load plans are not approved. So the vessel goes on standby while we wait for those load approvals, which again, it's into the, the it extends the, the birth port stay of that that vessel, but it negatively impacts the next vessel that must come in and utilize that berth. And then again, to my point, the vessel should not be berthed without an approved stowage load plan. At NCT, we've had that in place now for the last couple of months, and it is working well. And we do find that the vessels turn around much quicker. As I said, we, with that being said, with not allowing vessels to berth without an approved load plan, it makes it easier to treat each vessel as a transaction. And then they also suggested that we um, develop terminal handling charges for stow plans, which will, which are, a, which which are coupled with a service plan, as well as when the the that they should give you a stow plan or a working plan that will make you be able to allocate maximum cranes onto that vessel. Because you would have your pro forma birth plan that would call for three cranes or four cranes. However, if you have reduced load or discharge, 
based on your pro forma, you then automatically reduce your allocation of your, your resources, which then means you cannot work that vessel effectively. What we find also is the condition of twist locks. Most of them are rusted on the vessel and twist locks you utilize to keep the containers together so that they don't topple over and you have a collapsed stack on the vessel or while the vessel is sailing. sailing. So those keep the, the, the containers um, safely on your vessel. And you'll find those need to be opened and most of them, as I say, are rusty or they're not, they are not maintained. So you will have these consistent delays because the, the, you are struggling to open the twist locks. And then uh, stack fumes or gases from the vessels, more so in the reefer season, because those engines need to continue running so that they can maintain the power on board the vessel so that the reefers can maintain their temperatures. Vessel structure issues that we have, you would have, um, we would call it uh, just the vessel structure and you would find that it's incorrect. So when once you are, you've already planned the vessel and you'll only find out that structure is incorrect when the, the, the crane operator wants to load a discharge box and you'd find that it's not there, you know, for you to, that that space on the vessel is not there for you to stow that container. And then from a um, perspective of uh, the, the gate appointments or the truck booking system, put up a terminal handling charge for people who utilize or who book slots and not utilize those slots or they arrive late. So which means again, they are utilizing somebody else's slot and you have to, to attend to, to that. So with that being said, yes, there are quite a few things that have been put in place. For NCT, we have got the, the BI system in place where we measure each and every move, whether it's the operator as well as your, um, your crane operator, your RTG operator, your truck driver. And this is in place in Cape Town as well. So we don't wait until the end of the shift or at the end of the 24 hour period. We measure that at the end of every second hour or every hour. And then if we find that somebody is not performing up to the standard, that person will be called in and say, and show them, this is what you've performed for the last hour. Please improve on it. And it is really working well. Um, that's basically it. And then also the incentive scheme that's, that Lufuno made mention about um, it is you'll find that we, we, we do find that people are moving, you know, they are, are aligning to their, their, their KPIs, their personal KPIs. And um, you can actually see it at NCT where you find the vessels are turning around much quicker. You don't have vessels at anchor most days. And yeah, so that's basically it. Thanks, uh, Harry. I'll hold for questions. It's it, but it's a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Don. It's almost frightening to see all the challenges you guys are facing. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. We are looking forward to engaging with you just now and questions and answers. Thank you very much, Don. Ladies and gents, our next uh, presenter is Mr. Keith Sabisi. He's the business executive of Richard Bay Terminals. He's going to talk about their operational plans. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, Chair. Yeah. Keith, your audio is not coming through clearly. Uh, how, how am I now, Chair? Is that is that fine? That is much better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I wanted to switch on my video uh, during the greeting stages so that everybody can just maybe uh, put a a, a a a name to face, and then I will great. quickly shut it down. To Uh, 
Okay. If we, we are a bit, cha a bit challenged for time, so if you can perhaps start a presentation and share your screen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to check. I'm, I'm, uh, seems to be a small leg on my side. Apologies. Can I uh, request uh, Ash on the call uh, from our side, if you can just maybe uh, flash it up so long uh, and then we can uh, I can talk to it, not uh, hold back the, the forum. I literally just wanted to uh, put a, a, a face to a name and that's why I've switched on my calendar, but with the network dipping up and will allow me I will I'll bring it down and just manage the bandwidth uh, for, for for everybody thank you thank you thank you thank you Ashley uh, thank you Ashley uh, and we can go on to the next slide. And, and, and uh, in the spirit of the previous uh, colleagues that have shared, uh, I will also just, you know, focus on the key, uh, highlight the key focus areas uh, for, for, for the Riches Bay Terminal, specifically for the forum. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the good stories that uh, maybe are coming out of the Riches Bay precinct specifically, uh, as well as some of the challenges just to paint a picture and then the short to medium term uh, plans that we are uh, uh, that we're working on uh, strategically in the uh, in the in the region so uh, for, for, for maybe the colleagues not familiar with the terminal this is the overview of the richest bay terminal uh, classified into two uh, uh, precinct uh, the multi-purpose terminal and the 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 the, the, the dry bulk terminal uh, the, the two red lines or so anything between the two red lines really on all the way to the key side is part of the dry bulk terminal which specializes in the in the, in, in magnetite chrome coal and and imports of the hard coal uh, amongst the key commodities in that space we have two tippling facilities at the at the, at the top of the screen and 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 the, the the storage areas are in the middle of the screen uh, and, and, and the key export routes uh, run from 703, 704, and 801. Uh, and we do imports on, 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 on 609 on the left, and we have the finger jetty, which facilitates uh, exports on the, on, 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 on the right of the screen. The multipurpose terminal uh, is then the far right of the, of, the, of the screen, and the far left of the screen, uh, 606 to 608 and 706 to 708 at the other, other end. Design capacities uh, for the dry bulk terminal is the 26.6 million tons. And the MPT terminal currently sitting at 8.7 million tons. Uh, uh, thank you, Ash. So these are the key uh, uh, focus areas uh, with respect to challenges and achievements uh, for the current uh, a financial year in the near future, near term. Uh, we, I think the, uh, most of the forum will be aware that we had a, an event in, in Richest Bay, which sort of like uh, shocked and forced us into a strategic step change uh, in, in uh, you know, a force major event in, in, in terms of a fire, uh, which then uh, necessitated, you know, uh, maybe a change in some of the focus areas for the, for, for the terminal, at least in the short term, just to uh, enable uh, throughput and also then brought in certain strategic projects for, for the near future, which were, would not have been part of our plan or plans ordinarily. Uh, suffice to say, though, that uh, some of the focus areas for, for, for service delivery right now is about uh, the, 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 the uh, dealing with the routes affected by the fire and optimize current BCP operations. Uh, we're basically standing for uh, business continuity plans operations. Uh, so, as I was saying, we had a crisis. Uh, significant routes were damaged by the fire, uh, and 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 it was a matter of then uh, 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 should we continue? Should we stop those operations altogether as the terminal, which would have meant you know, shutting down of, 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 of mines and, and has then a ripple in, in, a impact on, on employment and so on and, and so forth in those regions. Shutting down of, of smelting operations, you know, steel operations, fertilizer operations, 
and, 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 and aluminium operations around Richards Bay. And strategically then, the, the TPT uh, Transnet said that is not a position that we can take. Uh, it is not a, a direction that we can allow to, to unfold. And we had to, uh, within a, a space of a week of, of those fires uh, occurring, we, we had to find and activate uh, alternative operations to make sure that those industries could continue to, to operate. Uh, some of them uh, at a snail's pace initially, and, and then you implement initiatives to, to, to pick up gradually while you deal with the wider infrastructure recovery project that, that is required to come out of it. So uh, we activated uh, the alternative loading and offloading operations. Not a single one of those businesses came to an abrupt stop uh, due to the fire. Uh, we are now prioritizing the engineering projects to, to get the, 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 the routes affected by the fires. And we actually are working very well with the affected stakeholders, specifically collaborative efforts uh, to find short term solutions that will allow for you know, quick wins in terms of getting uh, access to a route infrastructure, a convergence of infrastructure as, 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 as soon as possible. Uh, our poor equipment reliability has been uh, one of our, uh, our pain and therefore a key focus area. Uh, there is now in place a strategic uh, partnership with uh, Transnet Engineering, who are specialist engineers within the, the, the Transnet group, and they are now assisting us uh, to, 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 to really get the equipment back into operations <clears throat> and also make sure that our maintenance regime and, 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 and repair regime is preventative, and then you can get uh, equipment and facilities back into operation as quickly as possible. We're also collaborating with the customer base in Richards Bay with regards to equipment efficiency and, and better equipment quality getting into our operations. Uh, customers are actually uh, periodically uh, partnering with us to bring in certain pieces of equipment that are, they may, may be necessary to, 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 to sustain uh, efficient operations. Uh, gang availability at the multipurpose terminal is one of the key focus areas. Uh, the, the, the current M East uh, management executive in the terminal have managed to, just by reprioritizing uh, resources within the terminal and making sure that the people are sitting in the right seats in the bus, uh, in, the, in the areas where they're pointed or should have been, have managed then to reorganize from nine uh, gangs uh, back to 13 gangs. The focus now is to get uh, to 18 uh, gangs in the terminal, and that requires a, a recruitment processes, which will start, and 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 then supported by the maintenance regime on the equipment behind the gangs, uh, uh, which talks to then the partnership with the likes of of Transit Engineering that I've spoken to. There is an efficiency improvement drive uh, to reduce the number of vessels awaiting at outer anchorage. Uh, and uh, there is a slide uh, in the process specifically to uh, to this that I will share, but really uh, it is about what happened immediately after the fire, where the, we found ourselves sitting close to 30 vessels waiting outside at any given point in time, and what have we been doing uh, between then and now uh, to to streamline focus uh, uh, resources and, and 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 energies to drive that number down sustainably which then puts us in a better footing uh, uh, going forward in terms of uh, more uh, throughput capacity being created and available to uh, shippers uh, in and out of Richard Spain. The, uh, 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 one of the uh, uh, good stories that uh, has uh, been coming out of Richard Spain really is around how we, we try and facilitate uh, collaboratively with uh, strategic industries facilitate uh, you know throughput of, of, of key strategic commodities for the country uh, specifically so uh, where there are smelters at risk uh, where are plant the plants at risk we collaboratively with the that supply chain uh, from shipping lines to cargo owner uh, to end receiver I manage the supply chain and the vessel movement specifically just to ensure that you know that vessel comes in and out as quickly as possible and that cargo gets to that plant uh, quickly or vice versa. A uh, case in point is um, a couple of weeks ago, I think 
the colleagues would have noted the, the, the crisis around uh, chlorine shortage in the country, mainly linked to a short, short supply, uh, uh, a salt supply chain uh, uh, being disrupted for the country, uh, salt needed in the in the plants and how then to manufacture uh, chlorine. So uh, together with then the various supply chain uh, owners in, in the process, including the, 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 the producer, we managed to, to facilitate moving of the vessel from source to Riches Bay uh, without any delays and the cargo did get to to the plants a, 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 you know, timelessly to, to facilitate the manufacture process. And therefore, you know, uh, we, we are vetted, a, a, a assisted to have played our small part uh, in the process to, to avert a, a national crisis in terms of a, 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 a water uh, a suitable water uh, uh, solution uh, for for the for the country or availability for the country. So I just wanted to share that you know there's challenges, but also there is a, a proactive uh, initiatives collaboratively and and, and 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 good stories coming out of of the region as well. Uh, Ash, thank you. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So this is one of our biggest disruptors uh, to, to functioning as an efficient terminal uh, uh, that I was talking to uh, uh, from between the 6th of October to the 13th of October, the Riches Bay terminal experienced, uh, you know, uh, 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 significant uh, fires. Uh, the first one was on the GO2, uh, which is uh, 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 just on top of the rail yard uh, uh, on the left hand side. It disrupted supply chains into into South 32 and 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 and, and, a, and AMSA, who is a, a steel producer, uh, the South Africa steel producer, and then uh, uh, the second fire uh, on the 13th of 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 of, uh, of, of, of October, barely a week, uh, within two weeks, uh, occurred, uh, which then had. Uh, significantly on the sulfur route, uh, there was a sulfur import vessel on, on Beth, and that had the impact of really severing all uh, connection to 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 the likes of Fosco, to the uh, likes of the uh, Riches Bay, uh, uh, Coal Terminal, Grimrod, RBTG, and that again uh, meant that you know those facilities could come to a stop, or we had to find alternative solutions to keep the industries going, like we like I indicated and we uh, and we did. So uh, we are now sustaining those and the focus is on again the collaborative approach to bring the routes back into operation as uh, in the shortest time uh, as possible. Uh, uh, that's the picture of the constraint uh, uh, colleagues on this page. So uh, Ash, if you'll move on, thank you. And really this is the uh, the picture of uh, where we are now in dealing with the constraint uh, and which is the, the, the key measure uh, from the whole process. So we immediately deployed the CI uh, team uh, from various elements of, 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 of Transnet uh, championed by uh, the, the executive manager for, 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 for continuous improvement at TPT. So the team has been on the ground since, since uh, really uh, December. It starts with the analysis and then they put measures in place and, and initiatives which then seeks to, to uh, improve efficiencies and and, 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 and and the focus was to is to end up with a reduced number of vessels waiting outside at outer anchorage. Uh, the focus has been uh, on, 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 on what is termed treating each vessel as a transaction. So study each vessel from, from, from beginning to end. Uh, from outer, from the point it arrives at outer encourage uh, to the point where the the pilot uh, gets off the vessel uh, once it leaves uh, SA water, as it leaves SA waters. What is that time uh, taken? What were the various constraints, uh, shortcomings on our side? You know, what did we do right so that we can learn from those things? And then the the technical teams, operations teams. Uh, supply chain uh, partners involved, including customers, agents, are then called uh, to 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 respond accordingly to the constraints identified by the by the by the continuous improvement initiative. So on the left of the screen is where we were very disrupted. Uh, please stay on the screen for a little bit. Thank you. So on the left of the screen, the left quadrant up until about the 23rd of January is where we were really disrupted. We were going up to 30 um, uh, vessels waiting outside.
I want to encourage uh, with 13 alongside at, at any given point in time. So you're talking over 40 vessels uh, in Riches Bay at our port at any given point in time. Uh, with uh, So the initiative then drove to a stabilization phase where we are able, which is the middle quadrant, where we are able to stabilize at, at plus minus 25 vessels waiting outside. Uh, uh, because of the uh, operational efficiency initiatives being implemented. And, and we're now at a phase where uh, we are uh, reducing constantly below 20, uh, sometimes uh, reaching 15 and, and, and below, uh, but the trend is, is, is proving that uh, we are moving in the, in the right direction with regards to, to, to managing uh, the situation, the vessel stay situation uh, in which is better overall. Thank you, Ash. The next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an example of, 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 of what the team will do uh, when treating the, the vessel um, as a transaction. And, and each block really represents a, a, a each vessel, measuring uh, the, the, the key uh, 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 the key uh, touch points, uh, being the waiting time at outer anchorage, the arrival time to first hook, the time that you actually work the vessel and the sailing time out, and there's various contributors uh, to it. Uh, detailed analysis, tracking the vessel um, on an hourly basis uh, in those in, in those respects, and then of course uh, areas for improvement identified, and the various uh, stakeholders in the supply chain tasked with addressing those so that it doesn't it doesn't uh, incur or recur uh, going forward. As you can see, uh, if you the very first vessel uh, shown here as a mineral noble, where we were uh, literally, you know, uh, we, we stayed almost twice, uh, spent twice the the, 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 the the amount of time planned around around the, the terminal uh, to now uh, the the mineral noble. This is uh, as of as of last week, and there's more vessels uh, being packed as we speak. So there's 13 beds in operations where. Uh, able to, to, to get the vessel uh, wet uh, at a much shorter uh, time span than where we planned to. And it talks to overall efficiency, then cost efficiency for, for resource pay port users at the, at the end of the day. So uh, a highlight, I, I, did not, I did, not, did not want to go into specific, uh, you know, all the details with regards to this, but I think let's paint the picture of the quantum of the, of the work and the analysis that the team uh, dives to uh, per vessel on the key commodities in the port uh, in, in an effort to achieve uh, overall cost efficiency for, for, for our supply chain uh, partners. Uh, thank you, Ash. Next slide. So these are, this is then a highlight of the key operational uh, improvement areas that we're focusing on uh, for this year and the next financial year, which begins uh, 1st of April for Transnet. Uh, uh, first one being to address the, the shortage of critical skills. Uh, the colleagues, uh, Lufuno, uh, have touched on, 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 on the brain brain linked to the VSP uh, process. Uh, we, we, we have a high peak demand in certain uh, activities, uh, sorry, commodities uh, uh, that get handled through Riches Bay. Coal is one of them, uh, magnetite chrome amongst the biggest commodities that are experiencing high demand and therefore uh, you need the right people, the right amount of people and resources behind it. Uh, the, the technical initiatives, uh, collaborations uh, internally, externally uh, is also then uh, part of the focus to make sure that we are we have capacitated uh, to, 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 to provide the necessary throughput numbers uh, in the port. Uh, colleagues, you will shout if if maybe there's interference from the background noise. Uh, I am in an open uh, plan environment, so there could be interference. Uh, excuse us for that. Uh, the, the next area of focus is to improve equipment reliability, uh, uh, where we are uh, we have a, uh, implementing a proactive equipment maintenance regime, uh, and and making sure that the supply chain for for, for the necessary core spares is available. Uh, to, to, to draw uh, as and when things uh, go out of service so that they can be brought back as quickly as possible. Uh, the next one is the shortening of the supply chain process, again linked to that. Uh, we have a number of shops, shop five of them being one of the key 
spare storage area in Richards Bay. So we focus to make sure that we have the necessary core space, especially the ones that uh, uh, regularly uh, lead uh, to failure, uh, available for for withdrawal, uh, for withdrawal and, 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 and to fix the infrastructure, as well as then uh, 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 you know the the right a caliber of, of crew in the background to repair the equipment once it what is in the in, in, in the spare shop uh, the ci initiative uh, i will not uh, uh, dwell more on it but it remains as part of our processes now the focus like i said uh, because it's dealing with a disruptive in that event has been on the key side focus we now uh, are moved back to to the tiplers and are moving back to the supply chain all the way to uh, to the pit uh, or, or the plant so that then we can get efficiencies collaboratively right across the supply chain and, and not deal with one bottleneck and, and inadvertently then uh, uh, lead to bottlenecks elsewhere in the supply chain and that's the overall intention of the of the CI initiative so it will be ongoing it won't stop uh, uh, once the, uh, the, the, the the key side issues are, are dealt with. Uh, strategically we we operating, opening and operating a key a consolidation hubs, uh, which we call back of ports uh, 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 across the country. Uh, the ones that support which is space specifically is 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 is, is Penduren, uh, up in Rustenburg and Brits, which 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 is a consolidation hub for for for, for Chrome, and we've just operationalized one called Candle in Pomalanga. Which a uh, consolidation hub for 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 coal, and really the strategic intention there is to to make sure that uh, uh, the the junior mining community that does not have access to rail and has to load load whole long distances to 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 Eskom to Richards Bay to to Deben to Maputo. Uh, and where they can bring their cargo, get it onto rail, and then we facilitate uh, the movement of those cargos through to through to 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 the various um, uh, destinations, whether port or a, a, a plant or uh, ESCOM or otherwise. Thanks, Ash. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And this is the, the key slide, Chair. Uh, forgive me if I'm spending too much time. Uh, which is basically the long-term strategic initiatives beyond uh, this uh, March. Uh, the optimization of the current infrastructure is one of them. The, the construction of a CO1 conveyor system, uh, which will be completed uh, in just over 12 months time, which will allow us to, to dwell offload a single commodity on, 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 on two tiplers without, without a risk of contamination. Uh, we have a new mobile shiploader which has been delivered on the key site uh, now finalizing the due diligence and for implementation of or, or deployment of that uh, mobile shiploader by the 1st of April. Uh, that will allow us to then have more throughput for um, chrome magnetite and even coal through the finger jetty uh, in the in the near uh, in the in the medium term. Uh, some of the Key strategic focus that we're looking for long term is, of course, the, uh, the mega chrome terminal in Richards Bay. Uh, we have collaboratively worked with, uh, you know, producers uh, and, 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 and industry bodies to uh, uh, have consultants uh, validate and, 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 and provide, provide us with the reports of, of what's available in terms of uh, demand, uh, the source, as well as then the initiatives that can allow us to unlock uh, that, that 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 capacity. Uh, the next phase is then to um, uh, 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 evaluate uh, potential uh, options for how we can unlock the additional capacity. Uh, it does necessitate the finalization of the terminal master plan, as well as the port master plan for for Riches Bay, which is uh, which are in in, in progress. Uh, there is a supply co chain coordination. Uh, to support high throughput we do that through tvccs and tvps in collaboration with our customer base and industry bodies again uh, seeking to 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 maximize throughput across uh, the channel and, and 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 the last one being highlighted is the the overall rebuild of the of the of the, of the infrastructure 
uh, which has been uh, damaged by the by the by the fire. And they, uh, I think, I've indicated we had short-term initiatives, uh, which are preventative. We had medium-term initiatives, which is about getting uh, those routes as quickly back as possible, but maybe at not at total throughput. And then we have long-term uh, uh, initiatives that look to uh, you know getting back to uh, the conditions prior to the fire and 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 and, and a lot of it is actually being done collaboratively uh, collaboratively with the with the Regis Bay uh, 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 port user community to get it uh, uh, going in the right direction chair thank you I think that is the last slide that I would like to to share thank you back to you hey, thank you so much yes indeed uh, supply chain coordination is such an important thing that such a crucial role you guys are playing in this sense. So thank you very much for sharing this planning with us. Um, please stay online. Uh, there's one presentation left, and then we're going to do the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. So ladies and gents, uh, our last but not least presentation this afternoon is Paul Peters, executive manager of Iron Paul, Sardana Terminals. He's going to talk about Transnet's operational plans for Saldana terminals. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Harry. Good afternoon to the audience. Hi, Al. We just bring up the presentation. Thank you. Excellent, you can you continue. Can it's excellent, continue, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so just in this session this afternoon, I will be covering um, just in terms of the footprint of Saldana terminals, just so at least this context and understanding of Saldana terminals. Um, other than that, it, it can be um, quite vague in the sense as to what Saldana terminals do cover. As most of us do know, Saldana sits on the West Coast, and yet we are talking about the footprint that covers Saldana, Cape Town, and Port Elizabeth, or Kokeba as it's now known, and, and Kucha as well. So it's quite, it's quite a broad footprint. Um, I'll then step in terms of, just in terms of the positioning um, for, for the region, and also just touch on some of the long-term strategies um, for um, Saldana terminals as well. Stepping straight into just in terms of the network itself. Um, I'm not sure, Harry, just from my side, I can see there's a bit of a blue spot there. Hopefully it's not um, interfering with the presentation. It's just from my side that I can see it. Okay, that's fine, that's cleared. Okay, so just stepping back in terms of the, the footprint and the ports that we are covering. So Saldana terminal spans all the way from Saldana to Cape Town, to Port Elizabeth and to Kucha, along the west coast and the stretches into the, into the east. Of the five terminals, let me start off with um, the Saldana multipurpose terminal. That is, uh, it's, it's a newer terminal compared to the bulk terminal. Um, it's a terminal that handles it's a terminal that handles 8.5 million tons per annum. That has four berths. And um, the average draft alongside is between 12 to 13.5 meters. This terminal exports manganese. It exports iron ore. And um, I'll share a bit more in terms of the iron ore exports that comes across um, the berths at Saldana. And then it has some imports in terms of um, some steel coils. When we pass it, we used to be manufactured. And now we're actually seeing imports coming into the across the key side in Saldana. On the left hand side, we've got the bulk terminal Saldana, which is the fully fledged iron ore terminal. It is the largest um, iron ore terminal that we have in, in South Africa. It's, um, let me just move across to the next. Looks apologies. Here we go. Okay. Moving across to the terminal, I think this is of importance. Um, the bulk terminal exports uh, 60 million tons uh, per annum 
of export steel and it's across four exporters that um, exports um, through this facility. The strategic equipment that that we do use in this terminal is a fully mechanized terminal. So from the time that uh, trains arrive at the terminal, it gets offloaded by a uh, tippler. There's two of them. And then we have stacker reclaimers um, that then stacks products and also reclaims products for shipping. And it goes all the way up. Um, so on the top end of the, of the picture, we have two berths. So at any given point in time, we have one vessel that works alongside. And once we complete one, we swing the shiploaders across um, to start the next vessel. So very little time lost in between when we switch from one vessel to, to another, approximately 90 minutes in between. And that is really just in terms of doing route preparation before we start reclaiming for the for the next or of the next customer. Um, this facility is also given the quantum of the exports um, through Saldana for the Ino terminal. It has an air emissions license of 60 million tons. The next terminal is Cape Town MPT. So this is in the heart of Cape Town at the port of Cape Town. It's really uh, a complementary facility to the main Cape Town container terminal. Um, and by and large, this facility has container operations, it has bulk operations, of which uh, approximately 500,000 tons is manganese. Uh, we handle some import fish, and we also then handle most of it that comes through there is the reefer trade. And really, it's the West Africa, Middle East, and also the US trade that is serviced here. You know, it's a niche market that um, this terminal to service. Uh, this terminal has, um, just from a fleet perspective, it has uh, three mobile harbor cranes. So it can handle the larger vessels that call it the main container terminal, particularly because the larger vessels that's coming in now is gearless vessels. So it doesn't have its own gear and it would require that we utilize equipment that is suitable work, uh, these vessels. Um, it's not uh, huge uh, volumes, just in terms of the container facility. It handles um, between 190 to 125,000 TUs per annum. And as indicated by the bulk, we have the ability to handle 500 to at least uh, 1 million tons of, of manganese. Then stepping across to the Eastern Cape, uh, this is the manganese uh, bulk ore terminal. So this is the largest manganese ore terminal that we have also on the east, uh, which TPT operates. It's a single berth in which it's operated by um, vessels is serviced by two um, ship loaders. We have two tipplers there and then a fully fledged stockyard as well that is serviced with three reclaimers. The design capacity of this facility is 6 million tons. However, we are in the process of migrating this facility from PE to the Kuha terminal and this would then be in 2026. I thought it's important. So the new man the, the Nuha manganese export terminal has not been built yet, but this is the artist's impression. It's very much going to be similar to this. So essentially, this will be the home for the manganese that will be my, that will be migrating from PE to Nuha terminal. Um, it's a fully fully fledged um, bulk or terminal solution that will be coming through. Um, so exciting times for us. We're definitely looking forward to this. Uh, specifically, a lot of focus around the environmental sustainable solutions um, that has been um, factored in and has been considered for this terminal. Uh, okay, so just in terms of, of the, the environment that we operate in um, and, and what is it that we have to navigate through, what it is that we have experienced in terms of, ch of challenges and what opportunities are there. So by and large, being the largest uh, area within South Africa that uh, oversees and handles exports of manganese and iron ore, what we do find is that the demand for exports of iron ore and manganese far exceeds the available capacity for exports. So we are always looking for all different types of creative and innovative solutions to enable additional capacity. And most of part and parcel of our developmental and transformational mandate is that we also do want to capacitate and create access for emerging miners. Um, and most of it do come from the, from the Northern Cape. So that's a huge drive for us on our side, particularly to do the, the onboarding of, of new emerging miners 
whilst also creating capacity for existing um, customers and participants for economic growth. What we've also seen in this area, particularly for the Port of Cape Town, um, being closer to the hinterland there, we've seen exponential growth in terms of culture and fruit. In the past, we used to see a lot of fruit that has moved across the key site that has been shipped at ambient temperature. Given the protocols to the markets that we serve now, there is a requirement for cold treatment, and we've seen definite uptick in terms of the um, in terms of the the cold chain um, reefer trade um, from the port of Cape Town, and obviously in the other container terminals as well. You'll see the same picture, as like any other business, and particularly within the network that we operate in, uh, weather patterns is is something that we have to contend with. Um, it does impact our operation at certain uh, wind speeds. Unfortunately, we're not able to operate our equipment. And it's really safety mechanisms that's been built into the equipment that we do utilize. Um, some to the degree is that we unfortunately um, have to um, also apply prudency is that we've got to contend with fog, fog, human sake, and Saldana um, Bay, the same in the port of, of Cape Town. And of late um, that we had to contend with is sporadic, spor um, sporadic floods that we had to um, deal with where our rail tracks are impacted, which essentially cuts off supply of ore between the mine and the port in where it needs to be delivered to service vessels. Over and above that, which is also a key component in the environment that we operated, our network is quite, quite wide and broad, as I've indicated. We are sensitive to um, the communities that, um, that at least that is resident in and around our, our network, in and around the ports and also our rail networks. And, and we have seen, um, more unrest than what we've seen in the past. So social stability is something that's extremely key for us. Uh, we do work closely with communities. We collaborate with them. We also um, understand the needs of the community and also being a good corporate system to ensure that we also environmentally remain responsible around um, the areas that we do operate in. What we've also experienced um, Last year in 2021 was a cyber attack, and as some has, has indicated that um, we more so than others has, has bounced back quite uh, fairly quickly. So we had very little impact to our operations when the cyber attack uh, took place. Apart from that, we had to then start leaning towards manual processes that we had to then um, activate in order for operations to continue. But it was it was fairly swift, and um, that is something that um, does indicating you know the preparedness that you have to show when it comes to robust and disaster recovery plans that it does have a place in in the business um so with these challenges what has transpired is that um it does impact on vessels it does impact on trade routes it does impact on the reliability of of products from one market to the next um, so we've seen that but whilst we've dealt with the challenges you know what is it that we've that we've done well during the 2021 22 a business cycle of Transnet. We've seen and we've achieved the highest export uh, tons in, in any given month uh, through our bulk terminal in Saldana. We've exported 5.6 million tons in a 30-day period. Um, the closest to that was 5.3 million tons, so it is quite a, it's, it's a remarkable achievement for us. Essentially, everything has worked well that month. With regards to exports, we've also created access for emerging miners of additional one, one million tons. Um, and that is spread between PE and Soldana, that we've been able to at least open those access um, channels to um, a few additional miners that could now actually get their product out and export it uh, to the global, global markets. In terms of the container handling equipment, in order to support the reefer trade, in particular the agricultural produce out of Cape Town, um, this particular facility, we have strengthened the fleet requirements. Um, we have used to have two mobile harbor cranes. We brought in a brand new, um, another mobile harbor crane in order to support particularly the larger vessels coming in. Um, it also assisted us now with creating redundancy for maintenance and also dealing more swiftly in terms of particular, in terms of preventative maintenance that we need to undertake. Um, for the um, equipment for servicing containers. Whilst we were focused on the container handling equipment, we've also looked at the supply chain, how it is that we can regulate the supply chain to and from the port, and we've implemented a trucker pointing system. 
So at least now it is more regulated instead of just this conversion onto the port, which creates congestion in and around the city as well. So it's more regulated this now. It was a bit of teething um, when we started the, the, the um, truck appointment system, but um, it has, since then it has settled down and we also needed to understand what works for the environment that we do serve as well in terms of the um, appointment system that we've uh, implemented. Um, another achievement that, uh, you know, that we'd like to make mention of, the Saldana Bulk Terminal has also been nominated as the best commodity export terminal for Africa by the Capital Finance International. So essentially, it's a London-based uh, journal um, that showcases uh, particular the value that is added by various um, sectors. So this is whether it's individual or an entity. So in our case, it is transit port terminals in terms of our export facility. With this being said, uh, where to from here? With regards to our 2021-22 uh, year that we are closing, closing on, uh, just from an annual perspective, we see that given where we, given our initiatives for the next uh, business cycle, we should be able to take our exports from 55 million tons to 60 million tons, which is close uh, to a 10% increase. Manganese, that we know that there's a demand for approximately nearly 20, uh, between 20 and 23 million tons that needs to be exported. So we're also ramping up from 14.7 to 15.8 million tons. And this is across the two channels on our side. And containers we're ramping up because we've seen the surge in the river and the culture and produce that's coming through. So that's from 76,000 um, to use to 91,000. Um, what we've seen in the past, although many thought that break bulk is something that is stabilized and it's actually regressing. We've, however, on the flip side of this, we've seen a significant um, growth on the break bulk side. And this is more on the Saldana side that we've seen this. Um, there's some of the mines that is now particular in our case, there's the rock phosphate mine that is now um, commenced and is now ready with exports. And that is, uh, we've seen now jump essentially from 1.9 million to 2.6 million tons. Where we know in terms of, just in terms of the, the width, the bandwidth of that particular exports, we can um, achieve another million tons on top of that. In terms of the efficiencies itself, where, where do we find ourselves in order to achieve 16 million tons? through a bulk facility like an iron ore facility, uh, we need to achieve at least a, a tempo of 8,700 tons per hour. And that is the rate that we load a vessel. Um, we've had anything between 8,700 to 12,300 tons that we have achieved. Um, we are mindful in terms of um, the age of the equipment. We're mindful in terms of the stresses of vessels. Um, but we've also collaborated with customers, particularly for larger vessels, which has given us this uh, benefit. And at least it's a mutual and mutual benef beneficial um, benefit to both our customer and ourselves. In terms of our older plant, which is the bulk or the, the manganese terminal, um, you know, this plant has uh, been built in 1958. We've extended the operation by another five years until the new manganese terminal is um, commissioned. However, we've remained resolute um, to achieve a higher um, loading tempo in terms of productivity. So we're taking that from a base of 830 tons per hour that we've achieved for this year to 1,000 tons, just to at least to extract uh, great efficiencies and quicker vessel turnaround time. Just in terms of the focus for the next cycle, what exactly are those areas that we are going to spend time on and prepare for? is that we want to unlock additional million tons of um, manganese uh, through the port of Saldana and Cape Town. Um, we definitely want to accede to that target of 16 million tons uh, through the bulk terminal Saldana for iron ore. We see that it, it's, it will definitely benefit South Africa in terms of um, for, for balance of payments and um, also economically contributing uh, to the country. But with all of this, many of the plants that we do operate is they are equipment intensive, they, it's bulk appliance equipment. So we've collaborated um, with OEMs and we've started with form strategic relations and partnerships with them now, particularly to ensure that we've got a very good maintenance regime to ensure reliability. And obviously this then leads to a more competitive environment for our customers. Um, we can't do this on our own. Um, we acknowledge uh, that we need to work closely with our customers, we need to collaborate around innovation, um, how to do things better in terms of our operations and um, 
we hold each other also accountable in terms of particular for what it is that we would like to achieve for, for both um, uh, Transit and, and our customers, and obviously the role that we play in the, in the economy. Uh, last but not least, um, we're also learning from the best. Um, we've aggressively also engaged with many of the entities where they are leaders in, in maintenance and best practices so that we can onboard those practices and um, our service. Just to close the presentation from my side um, for Saldana Terminals, more the long-term um, outlook, the IMO terminal where we are today is at 60 million tons. We do 50 million tons. Our first tranche being 67 million tons. What we have done thus far is that we've already initiated and activated the application on the emissions license. And if you don't have the permit, you can't export. So um, we've started the preparatory work around that. And as close as April, we will be submitting our application. Manganese, where we know that particular 80% of the manganese globally comes from South Africa, at least from the, from the South African supply source. Um, we are also focused on having the new facility up and running by 2026, 20, 27. And that will give us access to 16 million tons through P and 6 million tons through Soldana. So Transit will continue with a dual strategy in terms of a dual channel to service manganese. And um, closing on this is that we do foresee, given that the solution in, in PE is a scalable solution, so the 16 million is scalable to 22 million tons, and then we're also looking at a bulk solution in Soldana to ramp it up from 6 to 8 million tons. So that then gives us that net export tons of 30 million, ton, 30 million tons in the foreseeable future, and this was probably anything from about five years uh, from there. From, yeah. um, Chair, um, that was in brief in terms of um, sharing the contribution that Soldana Terminals uh, do make to, to the economy and also in the areas that we do um, play a role in in terms of for the various customers and stakeholders. And there's obviously any questions, comments at this stage. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you so much. Uh, what a valuable contribution are you guys not making. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, please stay online, uh, ladies and gents. We're going to do a quick questions and answers now, uh, where the audience can can raise their hands, and I will recognize them to ask a question. Um, you can use the reactions at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Uh, when recognized, then you can unmute and ask your question to the panel. So, can we kindly have um, uh, Lufuno, um, Earl Peters, this Luganathan? Don Seister and Keith Sabrisi to please switch on your videos and unmute yourself so that I can bring you in to the panel, please. Enjoy, enjoy. Right, we're just bringing all in. Oh, we need uh, Earl. Earl, you okay? We're bringing Earl as well. Earl, can you start your, your video? Is it possible? Thank you, Earl. There we go. There we got our valued uh, panelists of today. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution this far. And let's start the panel discussion. Uh, you can ask a question to a panelist as a person or to the panel as a whole. And uh, and then we'll give the panel opportunity to respond. So, Tim Minkosi, you're welcome to ask your question. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Henry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, to start with, thank you to to all the presentation. My name is Tempinko Sizung from Tox uh, Logistics. My 
question is directed to Lufuno. Uh, thank you, Lufuno, for that detailed presentation. My question is to is to find out whether there is a study or a benchmark that has been conducted by Transnet on how or on the approach that uh, Transnet can or will adopt for enabling uh, new entrants uh, to the market and ensuring that cre uh, creating an inclusive economic partic participation, most importantly around manufacturing, supply and uh, beneficiation. Since you have talked uh, more detail on the contracts for space with OEM, and also I also looked at key focus initiatives and also the increase on 40 foot containers and um, you mentioned that working together so my question is around that whether there has been a study a full study that has been conducted by transnet to enable the new entrants in the in the market uh, i'm pretty sure it can be argued with um, the procurement policies that exist currently has not done much but they did they do work but not at the level uh, that it should be, but that can be argued uh, at some other time. Uh, thank you. I think my question is very clear. Thank you very much to give others. Thank you, Tim Ben Corsi. Thank you, Tim Ben Corsi. Um, Lufuna, before you respond, let's see, is there any uh, other question? Anybody else want to ask a question? The people are maybe a little bit tired. <laughs> so what, what we maybe can do is we can ask Lufuna to, to answer this question, and then we will take some closing remarks from our panelists, uh, should we not have had uh, another question in the meantime. So Lufundu, can you kindly um, answer that question there? Thanks, uh, Tembinkos. I, I think in terms of the study uh, that uh, Transnet has done, uh, I think we have uh, looked at different uh, options that are possible within the current uh, framework, and we are approaching it differently. If you look at the new entrants from the Port Authority, they do have the requirements uh, in terms of uh, making sure that there are new entrants when they issue out the concessions. And then from TPT perspective, the issue that I was talking about, the long-term agreement with the OEM, the study was not done, but Transnet it was done by DTIC. What they've done was to, to make sure that they, 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 they look at the market and realize that there are challenges with the issue of uh, 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 localization and local content uh, in particular within the manufacturing space. So what, we would be looking at is that even if we enter into partnership with the OEM, the DTIC is going to set some requirements and part of those requirements is building local uh, manufacturing in a manner that it's a scaling. If we have got a five-year contract or a seven-year or 10-year, whatever they would approve, they will then scale up that uh, the local content year one will be at this level and then we'll then have to look at the, the participant. But DTIC did a, a detailed study in terms of the, the, the current participant or uh, uh, players in the, in the space in which we operate for our equipment. And uh, for us to include the, 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 the entrance or the uh, a new players in the manufacturing space is to make sure that we then include them in that program where the, 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 the OEMs have to build the local a, 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 a manufacturing that supply them and that's at a particular period, they will then have to be required to meet a certain threshold uh, from local content and localization. Secondly, from a new entrance in, in terms of uh, 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 what we do as TPT, we also make sure that when we, we engage with the customers, we, for particularly in the bulk space, we, we look at the junior miners and emerging miners and try to see how best can we uh, sort of uh, accommodate them so that they can also have the space in terms of the, the export. And I think uh, uh, that's what we are currently doing in terms of the, 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 the initiative on the new entrants from uh, the export perspective, as well as from the supplier perspective, 
just to assist uh, 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 to assist in terms of the transformation agenda and the developmental mandate that we have as a state-owned enterprise. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Eri. I think I'll stop at that. I'm not sure if uh, my colleagues would want to add. Thank you, Rafuno. Uh, apologies that knowing Lonya just outside my office. Um, well, as well answered. Um, there's Thank another you. question. Uh, there's, a, there's a question from Sheldon Mohanram. Mohanram. Um, and that's quite a concerning issue he's asking here. An ongoing issue is that we are facing on the rail is cable theft and, and further reach on containers whilst they are on the rail. I agree that mo moving more containers from the port via rail will improve efficiency. But, contain, uh, well, but, uh, but cause customers prefer using the road due to the current issues we face with the rail. What, um, what measures can be put in place to mitigate these issues? I don't know if one of you perhaps want to comment on that one. Uh, that's a, uh, okay, this one's true. Give it a shot, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Lafon. I'll give it a shot, and and uh, the colleagues are welcome to to answer. Uh, obviously, uh, we work very uh, closely with the rail colleagues. Uh, we're running uh, between five to six trains between Johannesburg and Durban, and and that service is heavily impacted by by cable theft. In my presentation, I did allude to a dealing strategy, where we are railing early to the port. We are taking those boxes into a back of port and then obviously ensuring security of delivery into the terminal during stack time. Um, so it is quite a complex workaround so that we can get product to market uh, on time and in full uh, uh, Sheldon. Uh, and that's one of the, let's call it the logistics uh, enablers. Uh, from a security management perspective, obviously that's more on, on the TFR side. Uh, I know, uh, you know, just from the uh, high level discussions I've had with them on, on security, uh, you know, there's been deployments of drones, additional personnel on the ground, security. It, it is a very pervasive insurgency from a, from a criminality perspective. And, and you're looking at 700 kilometers of per way between Durban and Johannesburg and, and Pretoria as well. So it is complex, but I think from a logistics perspective, we have realized that we cannot have a security offer, officer for every kilometer of pairway. It's just simply physically impossible. We, we have to then come up with innovative designs from a logistics perspective. So hence the early railing, D-Link from a stack date and vessel, put it into the back of port and then uh, cross haul it in, into the terminal uh, to make stacks. So, so that's one of the initiatives we are working on and we hope to expand into the new financial year. Thank you. Uh, Lufuna? Thank you, Liz. Uh, I would like to say from the Transfer Forum side, uh, we're planning an event for the 7th of April. We're going to discuss role. And uh, obviously we're inviting Praza as well, but we've already invited the Chief Executive of Transnet Fred Rowe to come and present that day and talk about future of rail and transmix planning and so on, and Praza and so on. And uh, so that promises, I think, to be a very interesting event. So there we will distill rail, possible, uh, you know, um, quite well and, 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 and discuss it properly and document it properly. Uh, so that's the same of April will be hosted by the by University of Johannesburg. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me everybody is happy. Um, I'm extremely happy with this event. I think I can uh, echo what Lynn Witta is saying here. As someone who watches other countries' competitive ports, I've heard some great news for the future that gives me hope for South Africa ports. Many thanks to the Transnet presenters. So I want to give Transnet presenters a big hand today. I think that the, the knowledge and the content you've shared today is impressive. Um, it's constructive. Uh, gives me certainly lots of hope. Uh, I can see in the quality of your presentations, it's excellent. So uh, thank you very much for hosting the Toronto Forum today and engaging with us. And I'm quite sure this is also paving the way for constructive 
dialogue with the industry in the private sector. Uh, and thank you for, for, for your initiative in driving this transport forum event. I know you're planning to do much more, many more of them in the future. And we really appreciate that for engaging with the industry and, and uh, really come out and, and put out your hand to engage and collaborate with the industry. So thank you very much for that. Um, what we're going to do, so from a transit forum side, I would like to thank you. What I would like to do now is I'm going to ask for closing remarks. What I would like to do is to ask Dawn and then this and then Keith and then Paul to give closing remarks. And then uh, Lufuno, if Lufuno can be the last one to do closing remarks and also to close the session for us. Uh, before we, we do that, I just want to, to thank the team also at TPT, Salim Peterson, Peterson and then Ashley Schultz and, and, and Billy Kutsia and them for also helping and assisting us in putting this excellent uh, program together. So thank you very much, everybody. It's really appreciated from the transfer forum side. So let's do our closing remarks and then we'll to close the session. Thank you very much. If we can get started with Dawn. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, to echo your words, Harry, yes, it was great to have everybody around as well as that, so, so that we could have an opportunity to show you our challenges. However, also show you the mitigation actions that we've put in place or that we are currently have in place to to show the, the industry that we do have uh, plans and actions in place so that we can be better. And yes, yeah, specifically for the Eastern Cape, coming from the, the exercise of the World Bank, it was a real eye opener. And we are putting all of those those um, those recommendations in place for NCT. However, we're also carrying it over to the to Cape Town container terminals. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dawn. Really appreciate it. This. Thank you very, very much, Harry, and, and to all the attendees. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to engage. Um, it's it's my second one, and always it's so insightful to get the input from from the stakeholders. But for me, it's it's how we take this content and and we craft solutions with it. Uh, and I think for Durban, we we have a jam packed peak season coming up. Uh, Harry and colleagues and stakeholders. Uh, uh, we're expecting some record uh, reefer volumes to come through Durban this, this season. And uh, all the uh, initiatives and the programs needs to find uh, fruition, excuse the pun, during this season. So we're looking forward to it, uh, as always, to work with our stakeholders in a collaborative way. Uh, we can do so much more together and in a united way. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Vince, Vince for those kind words. And yeah, thank you very much for your support. Keith. Uh, thank you, uh, Harry. So uh, I think just to echo the, the colleague's sentiment, uh, uh, our appreciation to to the various stakeholders on the call, uh, just for you know the work as it happens behind the scenes, and and the the interactions and the collaboration that we that we that we that we do receive on a day to day, and and and, and hopefully we'll continue to to build on that and sustain it going forward. Uh, it is not always an easy road. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done uh, coll uh, collaboratively uh, going forward. I think uh, our appreciation and the ask uh, for, for everybody's appreciation is that uh, uh, we, we we will not grow South Africa Inc. Uh, alone as, as, as TPT and, and Transnet. You know, it takes a, the, the whole village to, to build this. So the whole supply chain uh, has to work together and, and, and come together to, to, to sustain and build going forward. So just my, my word of appreciation of the, you know, the level of collaboration that we receive during the difficult times and also to chat away forward as we regularly uh, do. Uh, that will be my parting uh, shot, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, collaboration is absolutely crucial. Thank you very much for that. Oh. Uh, just from my side, also um, to echo the words of the previous presenters as well, <clears throat> particularly the creation of platforms such as this um, that creates awareness, that uh, creates um, at least a catalyst for um, partnering on um, what's required for economy, for economic growth. Also, how do we economically contribute in particular and how do we support the various um, sectors that we do service? 
we've got a very direct strategy, uh, particularly talking to various segments of, of the economy. And um, it's, it's, it's focused around that in terms of um, growing these, these spheres. Um, importantly for us as well as that the support for um, the emerging um, miners, particularly the sector that we are playing in, um, we will continue to drive those type of initiatives to start onboarding emerging miners um, as we create um, capacity and access uh, to markets for, for the exports um, from our shores. Um, one of the um, comments that I've also seen is around beneficiation. Um, we also want to reach that particular <clears throat> uh, point where we want to say, instead of sending raw material out of the country, we've got to add value to it and so that it can leave as a beneficiated product. And that we will have to work together in order to achieve the same whilst we step into the manufacturing space to create our own um, presence as well in the global markets. Um, with that, Harry, and to the audience, thank you very much. Thank you all. Well said, and I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you guys again in the future. Thank you very much. Dr. would you kindly close the session for us? Thank you very much, Harry, for the opportunity. We really, really appreciate the platform. As we indicated when we started that our association with this platform is beneficial to both us and to the participant and the industry at large. We are grateful for this opportunity. We took the decision that we want to be as open as possible, frank and honest with our challenges so that together we can come up with a solution. We don't have all the solutions, but we believe that as uh, different uh, as stakeholders with uh, interest in this uh, uh, business, we're all going to contribute. We have indicated that we want to reinvigorate for competitiveness and future growth, and that we don't want to go fast alone, but we want to go far and to go together. And we're looking forward to, 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 to the write-up, uh, uh, Harry, and also for more input. This is not the uh, start, um, the, 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 the end of this discussion is the start. We will continuously engage via this platform to provide update and also looking forward for input. And we will make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we will be able to come and say we've made mistakes. And then how do we correct it? It's the spirit of collaboration and the spirit that says we all need to hold our hands together for us to take us out of where we find ourselves. Uh, Deben was port number one. We are port number three. You look at uh, the Africa uh, uh, GDP. We are no longer number one, we're number three. All this requires us to join, uh, to join our hands. We do not want to continue to be seen as part of the binding constraint to the growth, but we want to be seen as enabler and catalyst and collaborators to ensure that we take our, our country uh, to the higher level. Thank you very much. And we appreciate all the, the, the input and even those, into, uh, those that are very constructive, we'll take them and then they will be part of our solution going forward. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues. Thank you, Lafuna. Thank you, Transnet. We we'll see you soon again. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Yes, yes.